uh, just inform anyone who is in attendance that uh, you can use your mobile phone through, uh, through a Wi-Fi connection and all devices should be muted. Um, password details are available on the gallery rules for anyone wanting to connect to the Assembly's Wi-Fi network, which is 3G and 4G, should not be used, and no recordings or photographs are to be taken during the session. So again, very welcome to the committee and welcome our new member, um, uh, Ms. Martina Anderson, to to committee. Um, during the session, we will be considering um, some subordinate legislation. There'll be a departmental <coughs> briefing on the budget, also on water and drainage policy and living with water programme, and then again on our regional planning and strategic planning. At this stage, well, we don't have any any apologies. We're for full house, this, house today. I don't have any chairperson's business. I'm moving then to draft minutes, which is at page five. Draft minutes of the meeting on the 12th of February. <laughs> Are members content? Great. Great. Thank you. Then moving to matters arising, page 11. Um, to matters arising from the meeting on the 12th of February. Um, does anyone have anything you'd like to say, Mr. Hilditch? Sure, just on item 11 there, which uh, we agreed to get in touch with the Minister of the Department again on the situation regarding the MOT situation. Um, it certainly came to my attention at first hand last week, and I know I've been banging on about the poor communication up to uh, recent days, but it happened actually right in front of me, whereby someone in the office uh, was given numbers to phone in relation to their MOT visitation, uh, received at least two different pieces of advice from uh, Direct NI and the DAV at Coleraine itself, also people receiving letters in advance. Uh, with the certificate extension of or receiving phone calls, but then receive a certificate and after that again. There just doesn't seem to be any consistency in what's happening. And I say to the, the point last week where I was actually present and heard the person getting two different pieces of advice was quite worrying because as I say we've been banging on about the communications of, of what's been going on <coughs> to the public and it is a bit of a concern and I think an update needs to be given from the Minister at least, yeah. I think that would be appropriate. I know other members have mentioned it to me as well, and we were going to raise it. the fact that we haven't received any substantial information in quite some time now from the department. And I know that the minister was receiving um, an interim engineer's report gotcha. um, last week, and again, we haven't received any update on that either. So it might be appropriate then. Just I know that you have followed up since the minister was here, but it would be useful just to get some further information, particularly around some of those issues, um, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, just in terms of the manner to rise, was obviously we agreed to schedule a briefing from officials around the Just Park contract. But since this meeting, I'm still getting reports of people being fined, still overcharged, charged for other people's parking activities, and this concern that this is continuing to go on. And there, there's real concerns around the stability of this app and people sort of being charged for other transactions. I don't know how we can follow this up with the department, but we do need to get an oversight of what's being done on this because it's really damaging the credibility. You know. Had to do that. It's scheduled. it's scheduled for the 18th, but it might yeah. be useful in, in the interim yeah. if there's any issues, particularly yeah. that you're finding. Um, Mr. Boylan. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And obviously, last week we'd asked for an update from the department relating to the MOT stuff. I agree with Mr. Hildage. I, I'm getting issues back in terms of communication. I mean, I appreciate the longer-standing issues with the lifts and everything else, but certainly how how the uh, information has been fed out and communication is a big key. And we we were again assured at one point through the briefings. I mean, it's it's something that I'm, I'm getting back through the office. So. As, as soon as possible, can we try and get some answers in relation to the definite communication element? Okay. <coughs> Members, any other issues in relation to my <coughs> At the stage, okay, thank you. Um, moving then to correspondence. Obviously, draw your attention to um, the um, grid, which has been in your parks at page 16 and 17, which outlines the various pieces of um, correspondence that the committee has received and also some suggested ar action. Um, I draw your attention to a copy of correspondence from BS Holdings to Northern Ireland Water regarding technology, which I believe could lend itself to enhancing the energy um, provider's status. Um, members are content to note this and include it again in the, the meeting pack for Northern Ireland Water briefing, if you're content to do that. 
Um, at page um, 20, there's correspondence from um, Atara Business regarding road safety and the issue uh, that they have raised around biannual MOTs for cars. Um, if members, the, the recommendation would be perhaps to note and forward to the department for their information. Mr. Moylan. Yeah, I just want to uh, actually comment on uh, not against Mr. Kerr or, or comments he's made. The, the issue for us, with those two issues, Chair, one was the biannual was asked to try and get rid of the backlog. It wasn't a long term solution. Um, you know, and the letter says road safety. This is about road safety because when we get a brief from the department, the department are saying to us, you know, it's up to the individual to look after their own vehicle. You know, it's down to the, the integrity of in, every individual. So I, I don't think the road safety element is it. But we've got to go back to why we asked for the biannual test was to, to get rid of the backlog. Um, and the other element was which we hadn't received. Um, a full understanding of it, and I would, I would appreciate it in relation to the actual legal evidence that the Minister said she got. She responded in the Chamber to some, but, but I take it the, the Member State, which Aaron, who run these tests for four to ten year old vehicles every two years, to my knowledge, that was a European directive. So I understand now that we're out of Europe. Thank you. The, the issue of, of whether that directive applies or not is one thing. And then the other problem is, are we then not going to comply with that directive? Because if that's the case, it still applies in terms of whether it gives us scope to change that rule. Do you understand where I'm coming from, Chair? And that, that's, that's another point. So clearly what I'm asking for, I'm asking for a clear legal definition in relation to can we apply that directive or not? And if not, why not? I understood that there may have been flexibilities within that and how it was applied. Absolutely, so, and, and, yeah. and the question that's because I mean it would be it would be concerning if if the directive is European directive and now all of a sudden because if there's a question mark over Brexit then what directive are we going to adopt or what procedure are we going to adopt? So I would like a clear clear line from from the department, please, of, of exactly where we're at in terms of the <coughs> legal advice. That's. Okay. I appreciate that, Chair. Thank you, Mr. McKee. Yeah, uh, I suppose just to pick up on some of the points, uh, I think Mr. McKee has a valid point, and he's basically referring to the points that people are using the MOT as their safety check in their car, and they're not checking their tyres when they should be, which is a valid point, and he's referred. His third paragraph seems to be a wee bit off skew, and I'm not going to mention the comments in it; you can all see them. But uh, I think it is worth noting to the department that people don't then turn into the, the MOT every two years and not be their safety check in the car. And as Mr. Boland said. It is up to people to make sure their car is safe, but he is saying, according to his letter, that people are using the MOT as their safety check and not yeah, their people. I appreciate that. Yeah, that, 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 that would be quite <coughs> foolish to do, if, because if you are in a road accident or you are stopped for some other reason with police, then certainly they will check your tyres. So but he has a valid point. It would be, it would yeah, be foolish no, for people just to, to rely on an MOT test just for, to, for the purpose of checking your tyres. Um, Mrs. Kelly. Well, I was just going to make the point that ignorance isn't a defence in a court of law, you know. And uh, I, I, you know, I know about the MOT test, but you know, at the end of the day, people are responsible for ensuring their cars are road safety. And the minister has made that point in every um, every interview that she has done. You know, uh, people should be very aware of their own responsibilities in relation to uh, road safety. Absolutely, no, that was very clear in the discussions we had last week in relation to, to road safety as well. Um, Okay, um, members content in relation to that. Um, moving then on to the remainder of the correspondence. Uh, page 24, we have received correspondence from the Construction Employers Federation congratulating myself on my appointment and obviously to request a meeting. Are you content that I meet with them? Yes. yes. Would anyone else like to attend that meeting? No volunteers. Okay. Yeah. What's your I've got an indication of what the date is. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll do that, and we can we can start if you wish to attend alongside. Sorry, Chair. Can I just cl clarify the Public Accounts Committee? Have we passed that? Have we? No, it was just a note. But if, oh, you, wish, if note. you wish to make a, part, a comment in relation to it. Well, no, I'd, I'd just I'd be interested whenever the recommendations are collated and come together that we might want to hear a wee bit more from uh, from the audit office. We can't do it until we can't do it until after. No, no, until after. But it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Chair, could I just ask? I'm on the PSC as well. Mm -hmm. 
conflict interest or do I have to clear that? Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, stage um, H 112. We have a um, ministerial response in relation to the Motorcycles Protective Headgear Amendments Regulations 2017. A number of members had raised concern in relation to that. A few comments to make? Yeah, Chair, I have. It's, it's something we brought up at the very first meeting, and it's not for me to fall out for every farmer in the country. Um, <laughs> the the issue is, it's legitimate enough in terms of. I mean, I, I respect the minister in the reply. It may be difficult to legislate for it, which is basically what's it, not so much the difficulty of it or how we go about it on, on the discussions over that. I, I just think I'm looking at it from a purely health and safety point of view. And whilst you're covered crossing the road, I mean, two fields. I mean, there's there's others who actually have been injured using using quads on land. So I mean, it's just to put it to the members. I mean, if there wants to be a debate about it, uh, to bring it forward and discuss with it all. But I mean, um, I'll take the minister's views on board at the minute, and if I want to pursue it, or, you know, I'd like to hear all the members' views on it. But the reason we asked about the the cycle helmets is. You have to put it on across the road, so it could be across just across two fields in a certain section. You don't have to wear the helmet. I, guess that's it. I mean, I don't mean I'd like to hear all the committee views on it to see what we'll pursue it. It's very much an issue for Dara. Yeah. Mm. So, if, if you want, perhaps that we make contact with the committee. Just Mr. Beggs is keen to jump Mr. in Beggs. here and yeah, um, me in this. I, I come from a, a rural community. Don't have a cause. It's not something personally applicable to myself or my family. But uh, I am concerned if we try to take things too far. How, is, how would it be policed? Are you going to go into all the individual farms and track down farmers who haven't got their, hat, their, their hats on? I think it's good advice that if you can safely do so, to wear a safety helmet. Uh, when, when on a motorbike or, or a quad, but we also need to take a balance with that. Is that farmers are frequently inspecting stock, and you have to see clearly and hear what's going on, so you can create other factors of risk. So I would be very concerned at any proposal to make helmets compulsory on private property. There's obviously there's, there's clearly a lot of work going on in DERA around um, farm safety and working alongside the health and safety executives and the Ulster Farmers Union and so on as well. So we, I'm, I would be pretty confident that these discussions are taking place with farmers in relation to their responsibility for themselves and, and their, their families in, in using um, machinery such as this. But still, if you want to follow it up further. No, I mean, it's part of the discussion, but I appreciate what Mr. Beggs is saying. We're not too far removed from the rural areas myself, so I understand the, the operation. All, all I'm saying is, even wrote, as part of the health and safety advice, I would like support even right to them just to remind people of the dangers of it. That's all. But I mean, I, I wouldn't pursue the issue of, of legislation or even, even consider that. So yeah, it's just to keep it on. Just a final point. Might it even be outside the remit of this committee if it's it's not on roads? I mean, it's, it's at what point does it become an entirely DERA issue well, rather it's, than <coughs> it's very much a DERA and industry. economy issue, particularly around um, health and safety executive. Uh, yeah. uh, but I'm guessing that these th these discussions have had, been held. Yeah. Um, but as the points obviously made in relation to how, how it's placed, Mrs. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, I just want to refer members to the final paragraph on page one one two. Where there, obviously the previous uh, Dard Minister Michelle O'Neill had responded, recognising the, uh, the health and safety risks and associated with uh, uh, the private land. But I think it also makes the point that it's not just about farmers; it's about other mm -hmm. uh, quad users. And I know uh, in the hospital, uh, one of the consultants uh, in NA at one time referred to quads as coffins on wheels. You know, so um, the health sector certainly takes it very seriously. I think this is something we should refer to the DERA committee for, for their, because obviously there have been, as you rightly pointed out, other discussions with the health and safety executive, etc. Um, draw that to their attention. Mr. Hildage. No, it's basically go along the lines of advice at this stage, and maybe just this is a matter of the DERA committee. Uh, there's been some great adverts on. Health and safety on mm -hmm. land, land and buildings and whatnot. They may include it in a future program. Yeah. Ms. Anderson. Um, I think it's part of the joint up government. Um, obviously, this doesn't fall into any the remit of any one department. 
And so there may be a role for the executive as well as for the minister that, that uh, uh, relates to this committee. So there may not be just one size fits all that's going to fit neatly into whether it's agriculture because uh, what, what Dolores has just read out is alarming at any level. Uh, and obviously something that this committee would share the concerns of the doctor. So and there's health. Uh, we've already, you've already talked about the economy. There's implications here around road safety. So surely in terms of making sure that there's that joint up approach in government, that all of the ministers are either notified in relation to this and see if we can get a collective response uh, to it across the executive. Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair. And, and that's why I, I'm to hear the views of all the members, because no matter what we speak about, everybody keeps referring to the different departments. So my colleagues just after raising the issue, we are in charge of road safety. So what I would suggest is obviously, certainly if we went back to the executive, but at least I'd like to support this committee to write to how the safety executive, the HSE, and just say, listen, as a reminder, just be mindful of health safety issues within the farming community. Okay, so That's a bit, but, but I have to say to some of the members as well, we can't keep acting in silos. It's, it's a collective. It's not just our, our own. We have responsibility for road safety. They have responsibility for other things. So we need to start working collectively as a group right across the executive. You know. okay, so just to, just to move it on, if you're content, then we write to um, the DERA committee, mm -hmm. yeah. um, highlighting our, the issues that have been discussed here, and also to the economy committee, raising that with the, the, the health and safety executive, just to see what what they're actually doing with regards to, you know, in the work around um, farm safety and, yep. in particular, the use of, of quad um, mm -hmm. Okay, appreciate okay. it. Um, just one other issue in relation to correspondence was, uh, it's at page 110, and it's from the House of Lords, um, the European Union Committee. Um, they are coming to Northern Ireland on Tuesday. And they would like uh, us to attend a lunch that they're hosting. Um, now, um, they've asked for the chair, deputy chair, for two or three members plus the clerk. And I know that the deputy chair is unable to attend. So could I have some volunteers who would like to attend that lunch? Mm -hmm. uh, subject to my, subject to subject my schedule. Your Mr. Beggs. Um, anyone else? Don't check the diary. Yeah. Check the diary. OK. And we'll come back to you then. With okay, thank you very much, <coughs> members. So, the rest of correspondence you're content to agree um, as highlighted in the mm -hmm. pages 16, 17. Okay, yes. Thank you. Moving then to our next item of business, item six, which is uh, consideration of SL1, and that's the Motorways Traffic and Metal Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and it's at page 114. The department proposes to make the above named statutory rule to extend the bus lane on the M1 motorway at Spursfield. The provision of the extended bus lane is intended to improve bus journey times and service reliability on the M1 and uh, therefore to encourage modal shift from car to bus use and help reduce congestion and encourage more use of the department's park and ride facilities in that location. It's proposed that the statutory rule will come into operation by November. Mm -hmm. So, um, this subject, this statutory rule, is subject to um, negative resolution. Do members have any comments to make on this? We do have officials. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would that be useful? Coming up, yeah. There are officials that we can call in if you'd like more information. Just like so, we briefing on it. Just. just is April this year? Okay. It was spring coming in April this year. Okay. Could we have um, officials, please? Welcome, Deidre Gallagher, Head of Transport Legislation Branch, Colin Sykes, Head of Network Maintenance in Eastern, and Basil Hazard, Strategic 
Food Improvement Team. Um, again, that's at Eastern. You're very welcome to committee uh, again this Thank morning. Uh, members would like to ask some questions just in relation to um, the SL1. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, not that I'm against it, I just want to find out a wee bit more. But see, in terms, um, obviously done an assessment. I was saying this will improve journey times. In terms of the shift, yeah. Yes, I, I'll answer that. Um, yes, it will do. Uh, we we have estimated this will save about at least two minutes of journey times for buses through this section of the scheme. Uh, we introduced similar bus lanes last March. On the M1A, over a four-kilometre section, and they're saving about seven minutes. <coughs> and, and as part of that, because um, we're keen to get people out of cars, is has there been any acts to work in terms of trying to encourage, as a result of what you're trying to do here, to encourage people to out of uh, cars and on the buses? Yes. Well, at the same time, uh, the Sprucefield Park and Ride site, which this will link up to, has been extended as well in the, in the last year. Uh, an extra 130 spaces have been added to it, bringing that up to 700 spaces. Uh, it's well used at the minute, and there are plans mm -hmm. to purchase the land in case it ever needs to be <coughs> further. Excellent. And just finally, in terms of congestion or any road safety issues, there's no. You've done all the assessments in relation to that, yeah? Yeah, the scheme has been through its road safety audit, and, uh, and that will be part of the the project development uh, say this is in place in, in other sections and there's been no no issues in terms of road safety with the operation of them no, i appreciate it i mean we're trying to get people out of cars and on the bus i appreciate it. just <coughs> just some days and coming down the road after driving for an hour and a half and then there's a i'd like to be on the bus myself some days with the congestion on the roads but i no, appreciate your answers thank you very much chair That's me. Um, mr buchanan thank you um i don't know who to direct this question to have you, have you any incidents or any Collisions with the previous period of time with the bus on the hard, as I call it on the hard shoulder. Have there been any incidents or collision? In in the last ten years, uh, when, when most of these bus lanes have been in place, uh, it has a very good safety record. There was only one minor incident where a, a vehicle was pulling onto the hard shoulder and it it uh, deflected on a bus that was coming up the hard shoulder. And that's one one incident in ten years of. All of these uh, bus lanes being announced. So, what we're looking at here, you refer to a further four lengths. Is, is a length meaning anything, or is that just uh, a, a length? A length in this case means a, a section of okay. the bus lane. It, it's in two sections here. If you're familiar with Junction 8, which is the Blairis yep. Junction, uh, the first two lengths are actually one on the main carriageway, and then the off slip is considered a separate length in terms of a scheduling it in the legislation. Uh, there's about 900 metres leading up to the junction, and then again the on-slip after the junction and the main section on the motorway is about another 800 metres there. So, to, so the bus is on the hard shoulder ultimately coming up to the junction. Does that bus stay on that hard shoulder effectively? And so what about vehicles then to, to turning off? How does that work? Because effectively you need to watch on your left side if you're on the slow lane as a car. Uh, you know. Well, the bus will be in the hard shoulder well before the junction. Yes. But yes. But if you're turning it off as a car to go down the junction? Uh, you'll, you'll go off in the normal bus slip lane. But you need to be obviously watching for a bus coming up, possibly you're inside. Well, you, won't, you won't be entering the same uh, bit of road space as the bus. The bus will be on the hard shoulder, the hard shoulder. separate from the lane. The whole time? Yes, the whole yeah. time. Yeah. There's, yeah. Yeah, there, there's no way for a vehicle to cross the hard okay, shoulder. Fair, 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 yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Okay. Mr Beggs? <coughs> uh, uh, just to develop this point a little bit more. Um, if it's bus lane to Blaris and then bus lane after it, this, this will be, what happens at that junction when potentially cars could be coming off? So how is that safety aspect dealt with? Uh, coming up to junction 8, uh, where the slip road ends just about 50 metres before the roundabout, the bus has to then give way to join into lane 1 of the slip road. Uh, but it's it's separate uh, as, as I was saying it's separate all the way down the off slip. Uh, just the 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 hard shoulder ends about 50 metres before. Okay. It, it's up to the bus to to join the lane one of the traffic uh, safely. Certainly, it's, it's good to hear there there is a very positive safety record. That was an area of concern, so I'm, I'm glad that that is positive. The other aspect of this um, bus lanes on hard shoulders. Um, recently, I was 
driving the opposite way at um, tea time, heading, heading out the way. And I was quite surprised. The traffic probably averaged about 30 mile an hour between Belfast and Lisburn. Literally stopped in the outside lane uh, on a number of occasions. Are there any plans to look at bus lanes going out of the city during peak times? Not at present. Uh, this, this is really linking the uh, traffic going into town from the park and ride site mm. to, to the city centre. Um, bus lanes do tend to be inward to, to get the traffic going there. I think the, Colin might correct me, the congestion problems going out of town in the peak would be down to break down a flow at certain junctions more, more than anything else. Okay. Um, Thank you. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. And just for a declaration of interest, I was pleased to be an employee of TransLink. Um, just in relation to when these, this is active, is there uh, monitoring from the traffic control centre in terms of any breakdown of cars so then the bus lane <coughs> can be changed over then to a hard shoulder? And what are the arrangements around that? Yes, uh, there are uh, CCTV cameras along the, the motorway, and yeah. a few have been installed in conjunction with this uh, bus lane. Uh, they, they're monitored from a control centre in, in Belfast, along with all other roads, I should say. Uh, there's nobody sitting specifically watching the motorway, but uh, th there are operators in the control centre watching a bank of cameras at all times, uh, and, and they will pick up on any incidents on, on that road or any road. If an incident does happen, the, the hard shoulder is always available uh, for use in an emergency. And if somebody pulls onto the hard shoulder, and this is observed, uh, there, there are signs associated with the bus lane that are variable message signs. They, they change their message to indicate that the bus lane has been suspended and that the buses shouldn't be using it. The bus drivers then, if they're in the lane, move out of the lane in normal traffic. Um, so when the bus lane is active at all times, there's someone in the traffic control centre monitoring the cameras? When this is there active. is, yes. Yes, because just aware of recent programme in terms of panorama around smart motorways and the need to monitor this on an active basis yeah. because the hard shoulder is there primarily <coughs> as a hard shoulder. The cars that break down, so when you're going to convert it into a bus lane, it does need to be monitored and they will need to close it. It is, uh, yes, we did, we did a safety assessment on, on the, option, the scheme yeah. before, before we built it in. Yeah. And uh, there are a number of safety factors. One was also. <coughs> The, temp the speed limit on yeah. the hard shoulder bus lane was reduced from, previously it was 50 miles an hour, we reduced it down to 40 miles okay. an hour as well. So the buses will be travelling at a lower speed. Okay. Um, the buses uh, are, are, I suppose, they're coming along at intervals of one or two minutes. You know, okay. it's not a continuous stream of traffic. No. So they, they have good visibility of what's ahead of them yeah. on the hard shoulder as well. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Any other member wish to ask any other questions? No? Intent? Okay, no, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So are members content with the proposals? Okay, great. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So we move then on to item 7, which is our departmental briefing on budget. Uh, Hansard will be recording this section of the meeting. Details of the briefing paper are at page 117. Just draw your attention to um, tabled items page 3, which is the Minister of Finance written statement for 2019-2020. It's public expenditure. And that's further alliances, which all members will, be made, will already be made aware of. We've tabled at page 7, spring estimates, which is 2019-20 um, for the department. At page 41, table papers is the Northern Ireland estimates, vote on account 2020-2021. And then at page 48, the Assembly Research and Information Service briefing paper, which is Assembly Committee engagement on the 2020-2021 departmental budget planning. Um, we have an attendance this morning, and very much welcome uh, Mr John McGrath, who is Deputy Secretary of Transport and Resources, Mr Gary Boyd, Acting Director of Finance, and Mr Terry Dean, um, Head of Financial Planning and Management. You are all very welcome. Thank you for coming this morning to brief us. Um, very welcome. News earlier in the week of the additional three million, which has been allocated by the Executive to Department of Infrastructure, so hopefully that will help to 
um, go a little way towards some I'm of the not, issues. A little way. And it'll be a little way, and I, I'm, I'm mindful of my words when I say that, but again, it, it is very welcome. So, um, Obviously, John, you were with us a few weeks ago and gave us a, a very brief oversight of some of the challenges which are, are in the department. And I know from the, depart from the briefing that you presented and the written briefing that you presented, obviously gives a, some more um, information in, in and around that um, and the difficulties that the department does have going forward. Um, mindful of the fact that we have spring estimates information and the vote on account, and then we're moving then towards budget. So uh, I'd be welcome, I think, the committee, on behalf of the committee, that you maybe use your, um, couch some of your comments in relation to those processes as yeah. we move forward on them. That's okay, Chair. First of all, um, welcome the opportunity to come and um, share some of our grief with, with the committee. Um, I mean, a lot of our issues are um, widely known, um, so I really propose to do a sort of overview of them and then give it much time for the committee to raise questions. But I appreciate that you would like a bit more explanation about the budget process itself in the estimate. So I'll ask Gary to open up and cover that if that's okay. Thank Thanks, John. Hey, Chair, um, the budget bill next week, uh, Budget Bill Northern Ireland 2020, the purpose of that is to provide legislative authority for the executive's revised spending plans after the January monitoring 1920. So it relates to the 1920 year. Uh, and then those will be uh, main estimates take place in Westminster in uh, have taken place in Westminster in October. So the January monitoring basically gives authority to, to supersede those plans. Um, the bill also includes a vote on account to allow departments to spend in the early months of 2021, but it's not a 2021 budget, so it really is focusing on um, giving authority for the 1920 spend and a vote on account for the early expenditure in 2021. <coughs> so that's really the process and the purpose. Thank you. Um, John, do you want to make any further comment? Okay, Minister, as I said, the budget position of the department has been well rehearsed, but a bit of background and in our view, uh, the severe budget constraints, as, as the Minister describes them, stem in particular from the 15-16 budget settlement for DRD at the time, when the Department was left to absorb some 60 million of resource pressures, and that resulted in up to the subsidy of transit, operating subsidy of that time about 13 million, a reduction in the funding of NIW from the level set by the regulator, um, a reduction in community transport, um, reductions in staffing spend in the department and a significant exodus from the department in terms of the VES scheme. Um, some reductions in the road safety budget, and I know you rehearsed that last week with some colleagues, and what can only be described as drastic cuts to the road maintenance budget, which was the last one left standing. Um, and we've basically teetered along since then because flat cash budget settlements have meant there's been no scope to address the damage and those main budgets that was done in 15-16. We have managed early by some significant in-year additions over the four years, but in some cases that has just got us back to providing a barely adequate service, particularly in terms of road maintenance. Um, and therefore, um, not only have we, we not been able to address those cuts, they have almost become institutionalised. Um, and the detrimental impact, particularly in the road network, has been compounded. Um, and so, where we got to, we have continually failed to fund NI water to the level prescribed by the regulator, which is deemed to be the, the right level, taking account of the efficiencies the company would do. Uh, we have only maintained the public transport network, which is an expansive network but does a lot of good across government and the public service. <coughs> through whittling down Translinks reserves, which has paid for the deficit. Those reserves are, however, finite, and we are almost at the end of that road. The, co the company has an operating deficit now of about £20 million. That is exacerbated by the funding deficit on the concessionary fair scheme, which has now risen to about £8 million in the current year. And with the demographics, will almost certainly increase going forward. Sorry, I did not catch the... What scheme is that, John? The concessionary fair scheme, David. Um, we continue to provide a 
poor skeleton, whatever, we, we've run out of euphemisms for the road maintenance service. The problems are widely known, so I won't rehearse them. The uh, Minister's post box is full of them, as indeed a member's questions. We're only, we've again only managed this year through in-year additions, both in terms of what we got in the general monitoring and then this latest supplement you've referred to, Chair. Uh, but, but we're nowhere near a proper service. Uh, and worse than that, we're building up problems because we're simply not looking after the assets we've got. They are deteriorating in front of us. Um, we are running to community transport at two million less than it was four or five years ago, and there's real pressure issues there, and I'm sure members aren't familiar with them. <coughs> Road safety advertising budget is at a reduced level, but I think, as my colleague Linda made clear last year, we are we do different work these days on social media, and that therefore we sh we still to be we're running an effective service there, but obviously some more money would help. So in resource terms, we <coughs> continue to be strapped. It's a major issue in terms of the forthcoming or the current budget process for 2021, and the Minister has registered those points in the budget process, and we're recently in a dialogue with the Finance Minister last week. Um, turn to capital, capital to look after infrastructure. The infrastructure we have is core to how this place lives, works and thrives. We have custodianship of major public assets. The road network alone is valued at £27 billion. Um, there is a responsibility on government, I think, to discharge appropriate custodianship of these assets, and we are not in a position to do so, and that has been commented on uh, off late by the Audit Office on its report about structural maintenance. Um, <coughs> we began this year with £470 million capital. Now, it is the biggest capital block in the Northern Ireland block, but it is nowhere near what we need. Uh, if we look at the assets we have got, the evidence we have got from the Audit Office, the Barton Report, parallel work we have done in terms of MI Water and the Mail Permanent Way and public transport, we estimate we need about £350 million <coughs> Start with just to look after those assets, um, and therefore, if we did a bottom-up approach, most of the money would go in that before you got to. However, we we flagships, major flagship projects at the minute, with the A5, with the A6, and we've got the transport hub about to go on the ground, and they have major demands on it. Um, we have um, other major priorities coming along, and I want to talk about things like York Street, and those are priorities. We have the whole issue of the wastewater infrastructure, which is, I think, more in the public eye, more realisation that if that's not addressed, it's an inhibitor on social and economic growth in this place. Um, and again, with that, we want to invest more in public transport. We want to get more people out of cars. We want to improve the public transport offer. The success of Glider demonstrated what you can do if you have the right technology and the right offer. So we need money to invest in that. We want to invest in more in active travel. <coughs> the Minister makes that a priority. She also wants to make climate change a priority. We could go a long way in terms of no emission bus fleets, issues like that, but they all cost. And therefore, we estimate in the budget process before the new decade, new approach document came along that we needed about 800 million next year to do what we needed to do, rising to over a billion in the next two years. That is the lion's share of the Northern Ireland capital block as it stands. And then, when you look at a number of the aspirations or commitments in the new decade, new approach document, you can see we would need an awful lot more funding, and it's difficult at that minute to see where that might come from. Clearly, there is a local budget process. Clearly, there will be a national budget. I think the expectation <coughs> is certainly, in terms of capital, there could well be significant additions nationally, for which we would get the barnet consequences. And we would look forward to that. But obviously, there is no clear line of sight on that at the minute. And as things stand, it is not clear that the timetable for the UK budget will remain as it was with the change in chancellorship. Last week, so it is it's pretty uncertain at the minute. Um, and I say, capital, we do well in capital. We spend our capital. We get our projects done. Uh, we're spending about two billion a week on the A6 at the minute. 
we get things done. Our, our needs are far more and at the minute than supply chain of resources. That's, that's all I'm going to say to the Thank you very much. And you've obviously painted a very grim picture for us, so it hasn't cheered us up on a, on a, on a wet Wednesday morning, certainly. Um, since our last discussion, what discussions have you and the Minister had with the Finance Minister, obviously a previous um, Regional Development Minister, who's very mindful of the, the issues which you've highlighted, because none of this is, is new? Well, we have given our returns <coughs> to the Department of Finance even before Christmas or so was the process, and that's where you know, they sketched out what our needs were, both in terms of capital and resource, where the pressures, some of which are basically the pressures that we've had to deal with since 1516 or north, north of 60 million rising over the three years. Um, there was a <clears throat> bilateral last week with, between the Minister and the Finance Minister where she set out her concerns and, and what she saw as her needs, and, and that's where we are in the budget process at the minute. And throughout your, your presentation, you, you mentioned the sort of the basic needs of the department, and then obviously the aspirational um, yes. issues that have um, have come to light over this was over the last couple of years, and I suppose particularly around issues of climate change and so on as well, which are very much in people's foremost in people's minds. You do have a challenge within the department also with regards to to staff, and went through a period obviously of redundancy and. Um, yep. Very much, you're reducing your, your manpower and your skills. Has that had an impact on on some of the delivery of what you, you wanted well, to well, do? Well, yes. We um, because we were in straitened financial circumstances, we were fairly, I think, aggressive in the voluntary exit scheme. We allowed for a lot of staff to go to, so we could make savings. That meant those. Um, Almost overnight, I'd say it's a lot of knowledge lost, particularly in the uh, on the roadside. Um, we differ the, the model <coughs> that uh, my road's colleagues operate on is a different model now than what they had years ago. And later, we've been discussing it. You know, it's meant, for example, um, in previous years we could get extra money for structural maintenance even now and get it spent because we had the, ma the means to get it spent. Because we're running a, a leaner operation, we couldn't do it at this date, and therefore the timetable thinks that has switched forward. So it has had an impact. Uh, we are a very lean department. We, we, we joke on it a bit, but we don't have much corporate overhead whatsoever. We stripped down a lot of things. Um, 15, 16 on, we tried to find any spare pennies that were round, and we've never really come out of that. Now, that's a good challenge. It makes you realise what you need to spend funding on. But we are very tight for funding, and uh, particularly on staffing. And yet, for example, we are dealing with um, Brexit, and we have a lot of Brexit-related work because of uh, the whole issues around the freight industry and travel exiting, and we're managing that on a lot of staff, uh, lot of staff doubling up between their day jobs and that. So we are under pressure. So you, you don't have any fat in the system? No, Minister. Sorry, we have no fat, and I, I, I can genuinely say that. <coughs> that if anybody can find any, because I used to joke that our previous permanent secretary would go around and hold people up by their ankles and shake them to see was there any money there. Okay. And occasionally there was, but it's not there anymore. Okay, there's nothing down the back of the sofa. Uh, Mr. Beggs. <coughs> Thanks for the detailed budget briefing, and it's not not good reading. Uh, um, doesn't bode well for the short term, but uh, even more so for the long term. But um, in terms of capital, you've highlighted 100 areas where there there's needs for investment for Northern Water to enable planning restrictions to be lifted, and then there's problems with the road maintenance budget and needing to continue to invest in public transport. That's the capital side, the, the physical new yep. new buys. But actually, what gives me greatest concern is on the resource side, your day-to-day -day running costs is probably uh, employing staff. I, I take it would be the, the main part of the expenditure. And in particular, the report highlights that Northern Ireland Water has a shortfall in its resource of £7 million mm -hmm. and TransLink of £29 million. Um, 
And in terms of TransLink, the wording used is, is really ought to give everybody concern to avoid imminent and serious collapse of our public transport network. I mean, that is very, very concerning. But given that both these organisations are publicly owned companies, they must follow company law. And if they are to get the stage of insolvency, they will close. So my question is, what are the options for these organisations um, uh, in the short term if additional money is not provided? What, what uh, back plan do they have so that they do not become insolvent? Because we are talking about a very, very serious situation um, if we were to shut down TransLink and it were to go bankrupt. Yeah. Um, well, first I say these are two very well managed professional organisations in terms of the public sector. They are, and none, none of these issues are about the management of the companies. It's about their funding. So it's, it's the department and government's issue. Then I water one, and um, my colleagues are coming on later to talk about water. Can give me detail. We have not funded NI water to the level prescribed by the regulator since the PC15 period started at no stage. Um, in earlier years, NI water managed both because inflation was benign, the weather was benign, and they were more efficient than the regulator even ex expected them to be. So they're not at the same level of there's not an insolvency issue at the minute by not. There's an issue of them being funded adequately to do what they're doing. TransLink uh, is a different matter. Um, first of all, it's an issue of funding. It's not an issue of management of finances or anything. Very clear. We took money away in 15-16, and it was a decision of the then minister to, to cover a £60 million pound gap. And there was difficult issues there about the balance between taking, reducing the funding for NI Water and reducing TransLink, and it ended up to, to the, the room. Maintenance budget got the biggest hit. That reduction of funding then has you know, grown to 20 because we've got no funding for inflation or pay awards or anything. We have managed, and Transic has managed, to maintain the network and do improvements to it by drawing on its reserves. So when it does a loss of £15 million for one of the early years, that £15 million is paid for by the reserves because as a company it has to come from somewhere. Um, we're running out of that option now. Translink. Well, as things stand, if, we, if the numbers remain the same, faces going into 2021 with a deficit of about £28 million. Pounds. Its level of working capital is less than is recommended for a business of that size and the amount of cash that they through pay wages, fuel, stuff like that. There would be real challenges about the going concern test that the auditors would apply. And as you rightly say, directors have fiduciary responsibilities. They have issues about making sure that they can trade solvently. Um, and therefore, if events moved outside or control because of director's responsibility, company law, etc., you could face that therefore the company to trade has to make drastic action. But I, d I doubt um, there are the savings there that balance the books and yet run any sort of network. And that's the issue. It's the public transport network, yeah. is, and you, as you rightly picked up. I'm, I'm assuming that you have gone through some sort of scenario planning or options that will be available to TransLink. Are we talking about sh uh, closing down lesser used uh, town services, shutting down rural bus services, if, if, shutting down parts of railways? What, what, what are the real options well, that will uh, remain? Well, the problem is, first of all, well, there's two of them. I mean, first of all, there's a concession for us, but for basically, you know, we refund TransLink. So demand for that is now approaching 48, 50 million pounds, and our budget is 40 odds. And it's entirely inappropriate TransLink's left for the 10 million pound hold because the demand for a publicly funded scheme is exceeding the budget. Uh, and I think there's therefore issues, I think, about uh, whether we can afford to do that. And then it has its own operating deficit of 20. Um, some work we've done over years would suggest it would you would be decimating the public transport network to make that sort of saving. What 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 would happen? 
Well, I mean, you, to the other way around, you might only have to be able to keep running the things that wash their face, and that's very little. I mean, any successful public transport network is publicly subsidised anywhere from Fort to London. So if you ended up only running what was profitable, you're talking about bits of metro, some of the gold line routes. Or you could look at, and, and this is just because you, you know, it's not, it's not in a scenario anywhere, but a dollar off of it, you just close down the railway. Okay. Now that is not, I'd say that's not, there's no document sitting somewhere that. All I'm saying is because of the scale of this, there isn't a sort of, as the chair was referring to, there's not a sort of take your belt a bit and it'll be all right. The scale of it means that. In our view, the, the continued viability of the public transport network is um, in jeopardy. And what is the least time decision scale? be taken by TransLink or by the department? Which services would be cut? It would. Well, if we got to that, it would have to be agreed by the minister. But it, but it would not be. I mean, it, it would be things at the margins. You're talking about hacking at the bone, and even then, you mightn't. And then to cut services. You have issues about staffing, you have issues of redundancy, so you end up generating a big bill even to do that. You know, you've you got to pay a lot of money to downsize. And John, what are the timescales we're talking about in relation to having to look at the sort of new doomsdays? The timescales are upon us. I mean, it's, it's, it's February, and new, like new financial years in April. Okay. And, this, and just this, this to be clear, we have consistently be making this point over the last few years and not only within government but in public. The budget briefing document a couple of years ago went out around Christmas referred to the issues. We've only I mean I refer to this as kicking the can down the road. We've kicked it a bit because with some in year additions we bought another year. We don't have that anymore. But we've made the point, the minister's made the point I think when she was here. She's made the point to the finance minister. She's made it that uh, the executive collectively last week. I mean, this is a serious issue. Well, I, I do think we recognise that. We have heard this. This isn't, this isn't news to us. I don't think this is news to, to anyone. And so I, I know. I appreciate that, Chair. I just feel sometimes, and it's not, and when people think, well, we we'll manage a bit and, yeah. and live in your money, this organisation either needs proper funding for the public transport network that we benefit from. That, and, and we want more people in public transport, but the irony is expanding public transport means putting in more subsidy. I mean, Glider is the most successful thing that's been done here. It's an absolute star. We had people over from Department of Transport looking at it last week. Absolute. It, it, but it's costing us money. Because, you know, the patronage has gone up, and therefore the bill has gone up. You don't get a lot of you know, public transport addition, particularly when you've got a very generous concession first scheme without public subsidy. Okay, and with regards to your discussions then with the finance minister in relation to this, and I know this was obviously raised through for January monitoring, and there was no funding came as a consequence of that. I mean, what response are you getting from the Department of Finance? Well, as I said, I mean, the, the budget process now rightly in the hands of ministers. There's bilaterals going on between the finance minister and all the ministers. I know there was a discussion at the executive, but I'm not clear where. But I, I know, and I think it's fair to say, the finance minister with his issues about whether what's the timing of the budget here, but is it a normal time scale, or is it delayed to take account of what happens in the UK budget? And that's obviously complicated by what's happened. So I don't have any insight on what the numbers might look like. Okay. It's above my pay grade at the moment. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. Very welcome, John. Fortunately, you've brought the rain clouds inside today, so no good news at all, it seems. Uh, so long times as well. No, we, we do have good news. We do good things at Glider. Oh, they, yep. The schemes we do, it's just when you don't have enough money to do them, it's very, very difficult. And a lot of my colleagues, particularly in the road service, who are professional and engineers and want to do a good job, feel it very badly that they can't do it. It's, you know, it's almost personal for them. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, you did mention the loss of knowledge at the department, particularly around the road situation. Uh, does that then result in uh, consultants having to be engaged then on these schemes, uh, which normally wouldn't apply? It would be a department. Well, we do we, we do engage consultants on schemes, and we do a lot of design. 
as a replacement to those of um, I Not necessarily. We don't. But we have our own in-house consultancy, both to keep expertise inside and to enable us to, to be intelligent customer of consultants. Um, so there may well be the fact that we've had to do more. In the same way, we do a lot of work internally directly. Um, in some cases now, particularly a, a lot of street lending works, it's our own team who are doing it because we don't have the funds to employ contractors. So, I mean, it's a slimmed down organisation of what it was a few years ago. Now, sometimes that's good, but we did lose a lot of knowledge, knowledge yeah. across the department because in the middle of the VES thing, you were suddenly discovering every Friday a bunch of people you knew and worked with had just disappeared. Disappeared, gone. And hemorrhaging that experience out at that end, you're probably unable to bring in at the bottom end then, people to work up. It's not possible, potentially. Well, it's um, my Rhodes colleagues would have a better handle on this. So when you talk, um, Connor's coming in a week or two. Did you handle? I mean, I don't think we had difficulties recruiting, but you, you, we lost a lot of people. Some people who were the, you know, the two or three people who knew everything about a certain aspect, whether it was street lighting or something. And it's difficult to replace that knowledge and skill. On the other hand, is um, our age profile across the department, as indeed the civil service, is sort of to the right-hand side of the curve. So, and a lot of people went a bit earlier because of VS. So there was a sudden, you know. So you don't have the, the <coughs> distribution you might have in a normal workforce. I mean, we have a lot of people, not just professionals, or um, uh, general staff who are in the sort of 55 plus. I don't have. I have a group of 300 people. I don't think I have anyone under the age of 25, in it, which is quite, that end, think, quite yeah. remarkable. Uh, just on capital, then, and I suppose a lot of the buzz. But one of the buzzwords out there is in relation to the city days. Uh, yep. Is the department uh, a viable partner in the city days? Do you think moving forward, or is there not enough information yet? To no, we are, we are, we are a significant player. Um, first in the, the Belfast city day region, um, where subject to approval of the executive, we will be sponsoring and hence paying for Southern Belief Road. Um, Later to and the the Lagan, the Lagan Bridge, um, we are um, active in the work around the Derry City deal, but I'm not sure there'll be that many EFI projects in it. Although my permsec is the lead government official on the Derry City deal in general, um, and we're you know we regard them as important schemes, and we do a lot of work on those. But as I say, you would then the list of things you'd be funding going forward. You then add the city deal thing to the list of things that are that are coming off the top before you start. Yeah, that's where one to go. The other capital headings are potentially you've been escapables, pre-committed schemes, and high priority schemes. Could you just give us a flavour of the difference in those lines, Mister. Um, the right person yeah. all looks something very similar. Well, yeah, we could. We're great at producing tables. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the way we do our capital is, you know, what what's the absolute? We have to fund the, the flagship projects so they come off the top. Um, if the city deal are approved by the executive, because all the work to date was subject to the executive, then they would be the next call at the top. Then we've issues. I mean, essentially, the um, regulators' determination around what NI water should get. Is, is, is essentially inescapable in our view because it has the force of regulator. Um, we have um, real safety critical work that we deem you know needs to be done. We've while we're very concerned about the state of the road network of late, we've be, we've asked questions about the fabric of the, the permanent way because, as Chris Connolly would say, you can't see a pothole on a railway line, but if something goes by long, you know there's no there's no uh, Truck or anything on that. We've got um, the we're buying new carriages for the rail network, and that contract's been in place. And it's, uh, that was left about a year or more ago. So that's a, a contractual commitment. Um, we've got buses in procurement. Orders were placed last year. They're, they're continuing. So it goes down. We need to find money for Waterways Ireland. We're continuing the funding of the design phase of York Street. And that takes funding. Um, so there's a range of pieces like that. We still have what we call some of our SRI schemes that are 
progressing at the minute, but have not been given a formal go ahead to go live. But in a sense, they almost require money to keep turned over, and, and that will be an issue. We'll be after discussing with the minister whether we can afford to do all of those. And so we have a whole range of stuff, that, and then you get into becoming structural maintenance, more money for buses, what we're going to spend on um, cycling and greenways, uh, some funding for DVA, the LED programme on streetlights, um, Belfast Tidal project. It's just, I mean, when you've got the amount of infrastructure we've got, you get an awful lot of stuff which is just minding it. I mean, the road network is 27 billion, the rail network there is about three billion. We need to retain our bus fleet. It's, I mean, house, the housekeeping bill is sizable if you actually put money into housekeeping. But the public sector in general isn't good about looking after its assets. So it's a lot. But to say a real challenge would be, and has been, and it will be for the minister. If you do the top-down stuff, what have you left to look after your assets? If you do it bottom up, have you got enough to do the flagships before you get to? I mean, members here, and in fact, some of you will have written to the minister asking about the progress on the Cookstown bypass, Bonhage bypass, and the Skill bypass, the new trains to Park and Moira. I know them all because I read them every day. <laughs> and you just think, unless there's a huge supplement from the UK budget and capital, we cannot do all these things. Cannot. Thanks. And just a fairly on the old hobby horse and road safety. We this before numerous meetings. Uh, the budget, I think, is cut from a million to seven hundred thousand. <coughs> but prior to that, cut had been up around two or three million at one stage. It was a wee bit higher than that again. But nine out of ten uh, accidents in, in Northern Ireland are due to human error. Uh, I think yep, driver uh, behaviour. Yeah, bad behaviour, yeah. bad behaviour. Uh, I think it's important that we try and sustain road safety campaigns and such uh, like as best we indeed, can. Indeed, and I think Linda did a good job. Of it. It's not just about the money; it's how we spend the money. We do a lot more on social media and snippets like this, and we're very inventive. Um, but you're right, a lot the main issue is about driver behaviour. So and you talked last week, the road safety strategy is at an end and we'll it'll be one of the ministers issues to shape a new one and we've got to see what different approach we can take to that and is it the traditional approach to road safety and you know, try to be a bit more inventive to think because it's it is critical. Yeah, there's new ways to reach out there to the public. And well, we're talking about, I mean, I was sharing with the Minister in uh, Norway last year, no child died on the road whatsoever. In Oslo, only one person did, and that was by their own devices, because over years they've moved to actually take cars out of city centres, which is a good thing, and we're looking at their climate change, but it also reduces the scope for RTAs and stuff like that, so we're, we might be taking a much more holistic look at road safety. But then, but then there, are, there are differences between the urban setting and the rural setting, and there's a lot of issues with driver behaviour in rural areas, so we are looking for... We'll be taking a more joined-up approach to the department. We have dimensions. I mean, Linda would have talked last week about the education, the engineering and the enforcement, but there's a whole issue about planning and the way these places our places work and whether they're made to be safe. As I say, less cars about automatically will give you some road safety potential. Okay, thank you. All your questions have been answered. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Um, thank you. Thank you, John. And obviously, it was quite a depressing picture, and I don't envy your task of trying to uh, manage everything that, that you're trying to do, particularly in the context of the budgetary cuts. Um, to the block grant that have been going on uh, for years and then the complications of Brexit uh -huh. that you had referred to. I'm also conscious that public services um, are being sliced and diced and squeezed in the manner that they are. And when you compare that to an environment that's here in, in the north, where over the same period of time we have a growing number of millionaires, uh, we probably do need to be looking at um, ensuring that particularly public money um, is being spent in a way that is delivering for, for people. I have a number of questions. Forgive me, this is the uh, first opportunity I've had to engage with, uh, with, your, with you and your officials. Um, the concessionary fares 
have already wrote uh, to the Minister about this. And I say this in the context of the outline programme for government that was quite clearly stating that resources would be allocated based on objective need and the need to balance um, the regional economy and regional inequalities. And I want to talk about concessionary fares in the context of the North West and, for instance, my own hometown of Derry, but it may not be only applicable to there, that those um, who can fail of concessionary fares cannot get transport from Derry to the International Airport uh, or to the City Airport. You can get it anywhere else uh, around the North, but like Airport are used to provide that service, but because they don't have access to the automatic scanning hardware uh, that's used by TransLink. So I think that needs looked at, that if we are going to be tackling regional inequalities, then you cannot have a, sit a city with a population like Derry with people who are, and that's in the context of quite aware of what you said about the budgetary uh, constraints. I was reading the information that you had sent around or we received, and, uh, and I want to thank um, whether it is the, the clerks or yourselves for, for giving us a rundown on this. There's one issue that is um, very alarming for, for, for the people of Derry, and it has been going on for this executive and for the Assembly for many, many years. And I'm, I refer to a time in 2014, six years ago, when there was a debate um, in the chamber, in the assembly, around um, a scandal, really, that has taken place um, for a Mabari dump, and that is just um, now in a situation where, in 2014, we had an assembly debate on it. The scandal seems to be growing, and our role uh, in scrutinising both the department and others who may be responsible for this. So I'm conscious that there may be areas, and Chair, I'll be very careful of not to go into those areas that uh, may be subject to some, some uh, judiciary or legal challenge. But in 2017, when you have the planning appeal, who upheld the enforcement order from, from the Department now of Infrastructure to remove the, the toxic material, and I'm talking about the potential impact of pollution to the River Fawham and contamination to the drinking water of the people in Derry. And then just recently, the Public Accounts Committee upheld again the enforcement order and refused to, to quash um, an appeal that, that was taken forward. And that we are in a situation now where we have one department, and it refers back to something we talked about earlier, about the need for a joint up approach here, because we have your department uh, and your minister, and probably even in the context of one of her priorities around climate uh, justice, uh, in, in dealing with a situation that has been going on for years. And we are in a situation with that potential contamination to the River Fountain and the drinking water. And we have the department with an enforcement order. And one of the things that was said at the time, well, we need ministers in place in order to take it forward. Now we have. And now one minister is saying one thing in terms of planning and another is saying another. And that is where there is difficulties in this. So I would say that uh, there was a meeting last night um, in the city with regards to that. Um, I'm also concerned, and I'm sure other members are as, as well, around the issue of the wastewater programme. And again, I say this in the context um, of the North West. It was quite clear when we looked at the document, and everyone will know about how the document uh, was released in terms of the new decade, new approach, and, uh, and then parties having to decide whether we were going to go forward based on um, how it was launched and the way that it was. And again, that document talks about tackling regional disparities and, and regional inequalities. But with the wastewater programme, it has referenced uh, a Belfast scheme. But again, not, not the North West. And I am conscious that whether it is um, roads uh, or particularly housing that, is be, that needs to be built around the North West and in the city of Derry, that there are problems around, uh, around wastewater. It's, it's in a dire situation. And finally, and just lastly, I'd just like to know if the, if the Minister intends to engage with the Irish Government when one is established, of course, and who knows the role that we will be able to play in that. But uh, around the A5, because that document referred to 75 million uh, coming from the, the Irish Government, as opposed to its original commitment of 400 million. So 75 million is not going to cut it. It's not going to be enough. So just to get an update, if we can, if not, maybe you could return to that, or I could speak to someone, particularly in the department, about that. Um, yeah. Um, 
Well, on the planning issue, um, I'm not excited, not at all. So my we'll comments come afterwards, so I won't. You can come back I won't to me on that. Colleagues are coming up later. I'll take that back. Um, on the um, issues about concessionary fares, I mean, the issue of airporter accessing the, the scheme or leaving the scheme at one stage, or perhaps returning to it, it is under discussion because there are issues around audit. And certainly, when the new ticketing system is uh, fully in place in Transic in a year or so, it'd be much easier for others to access it. Uh, um, your point about the wastewater, and again, colleagues are coming afterwards. It is not exclusively a Belfast problem, but the most biggest concentration is in Belfast. But there are a number of areas across Northern Ireland where um, development has been inhibited by wastewater. It's not a Belfast only, but the, maybe the, the priority at the start may well need to be Belfast, but Simon and Linda are coming on after me this morning, and they're a better place for the detail of all that. And on the, on the latter point, I, the Minister has said that North South connectivity is one of her personal priorities, but I would expect that once um, clarity emerges from, uh, in terms of who the Irish Government is, and in particular who the Transport Minister has said she would want an early dialogue on um, A5 and indeed other, other issues. But I mean, the, the A5 is a um, very important scheme, it's also a very, very expensive scheme. I'm not saying that, you know, yeah, yeah, therefore, yeah. even with contribution, it, it is going to be a big swallow <coughs> like this. It'll, you're talking about the guts of a billion pounds. I mean, I think in relation to anything, to be honest with you, and people in the North West have, um, have heard you know, arguments like that or concerns like that or information like that being put on the table with regards to projects that is required. This is about tackling regional inequalities. No, this is not, about, I, you know, I, no, and I know you are supportive of that, but because, I just want I mean, to make the point that you could apply oh, no, that to not. anything um, that, that the Department needs to take forward. And I just want to make it clear to you that with regards to the priority of investment in Belfast with the, the wastewater infrastructure, of course um, that, that is required, but it's not about focusing solely on Belfast and ignoring the rest. The same kind of pressures are on the same population, smaller as they are in Derry, in Quite, the North West, I, I, than I, they are I, in Belfast. I, I, I wouldn't argue with that in the slightest. Thank you. And again, since the Minister has made the point about regional imbalance is one of her priorities, that is something yeah. we actively look at. But I, I would like to think <clears> for a lot of work we do, we are we do have a regional focus for that. But there are inherited problems in the the connectivity for the North West is an issue. Okay, and yep. I think the same point could be made for all of us in various constituencies across Northern Ireland. Um, Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and John, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I don't think you've been anybody's Christmas list after reporting that. But <laughs> we'll, we'll not hold that personally against you. The, um, and, and I understand, and I mean, for, for many of us, I mean, whilst we're getting a report today, and we're not going to solve it all within an hour and 15 minutes briefing, and a number of questions from members and some good questions already. But um, from from elected reps' point of view, it's actually how it impacts on individuals. Now, you know, somebody getting gritting done on the ground is important to them. We're sitting here talking about budgets and monies and, mm. and, and realise uh, like probably for most of us the roads issue is probably fifty percent of the complaints we get to, to our offices um, and I respect that. But I just, I just want to go back there, because you mentioned an interesting thing. You've lost capacity within the department in terms of through the, the scheme, people. Mm -hmm. if, if, you had, um, if you had the money in the morning, would you be able to address that? Well, it's, it would depend on depend what we wanted to do. I mean, we lost capacity, but we also lost spending power. But, um, if somebody wanted us to rack up our spending power, whether in road maintenance, or in capital schemes, then we might need more people. But if we, you know, we cut our cloth to what it is, so just increasing our staffing. If you didn't have the, on the roadside, just if you didn't have the money to spend, as you put it, on the front line, making a difference to make people go about their lives, and there wouldn't be any point to it. So it's, it is a balance. That's why we took an aggressive approach at the time to say we needed to get staff savings out to make a contribution to the overall 60 million pound hole we were facing. It wasn't a comfortable decision, 
No, no one, I, I appreciate that. And, and, and I mean, a lot of people were quite happy to go. I mean, it wasn't an issue to you know, themselves. I'm not feeling for it. It went to what might have been retiring a year or two later anyway, but it, it, you do reduce your cap, you reduce your capability and your capacity. Right. No, I appreciate that, and, and it's hard for us to get down to. I want to get down to some specific questions, but there's a broader discussion. Obviously, there's, there's a number of questions all the members can ask, and I'm just trying to st stick to the brief on what you've given today. I mean, like I say, we're not going to solve it all today, but in, in terms of, and, and we're mindful of the, the issues, especially. Rural roads and maintenance. Um, I mean, championing that for a long period of time. Just wanted just some of the stuff you've done. You, you've received the three million there in relation to the winter conditions. Can you expand a wee bit on that? What's the intentions of that, or can you give any? Well, the, we got some money in January monitoring itself, um, including 1.8 for stake adding, and then there was this sort of January monitoring plus. It came along uh, surprisingly and gave uh, another three million. Um, managed by the finance minister. Monday, the minister is deciding on the distribution of all the January monitoring money detail, but obviously some of the, the winter service because uh, we didn't have enough in the start of the year for winter service. Um, we're still spending significant sums at the minute, given that. Uh, Conditions. We need to make sure we have enough money to see us through to the end of the year, and that's a movable feast. And obviously, street lighting and potholes are issues. The detail of it, the minister will be deciding in the next matter of days, because obviously we need to get the money out. That's the point, you know. And I'm sure she will, but she is testing where she wants. It's not they're not huge amounts of money, but they can make a difference in local areas very quickly. Um, I just want to touch on the um, community transport issue. I mean, we, you know, we've had this broad discussion about MV permits and now the D1s, and you can see in terms of the overall budget and the impact, there's people out there with grandfather rights, there's people who haven't. Um, as a broader discussion uh, in relation to all of those things, I mean, if there's any consideration for change, you go back to the Ministry, because it can be quite expensive to go through that D1 process. Like it impacts on the community and voluntary sector. And what the trend the programmes are trying to roll out? Um, at the minute, there is no intention because the position that we took was based on an up to date interpretation of, of the law, and the law has not changed. So, um, I think our, certainly our advice on the matter would be there is no, there's very little scope to change anything. I mean, all of that issue was built up. The impact in some cases of schools and teachers driving buses and all of that is a very difficult issue. But at the heart of it, there's a fundamental issue about safety: who's driving buses with people on them. So I don't see us at the minute, subject to the view of the minister. I doubt if we would be changing position because the law hasn't changed. I appreciate it, and I know that in the likes of Scotland, Wales, there are grandfather rights and. And I asked in that context, I, I, I don't think, the, and I appreciate the road safety element, but I, I'm sort of coming from the community point, and it's like the other issue of about events there. It was on the radio this morning about events, community groups now are stopping some of these events, road races and road bows down my own area because of, I, I don't think I know those things we intend to do is to impact on communities that way. And I asked the question in that context. but. You have no intention to go back to the Minister? At the minute, I do not see that anything, any reason for us to change what our interpretation or the, the lawyer's interpretation of the law was, and nothing else has changed at the minute. If something changed, then obviously we would be going to the Minister on the issue. Okay, I just um, I want to pick up on the, the, uh, the DVA test centres. Uh, £48 million for five test centres. Is that, is that right? Um, you get through some of that stuff in relation to the test centres and in, in line with what's going on at the minute, the, the lifts issue and all that. Um, <coughs> is the money there for that, or is it going to be taken out of the reserves? Or can you expand I'm, a bit? I'm not. I'm not all over the DVA because it's so current at the minute, and other colleagues are dealing with it. So um, I don't think we'll have pinned down the precise funding implication and the extent to which. The DVA reserves can cover some of these things, but obviously, if they do, then it's at the cost of something else. Because whatever the reserves are, they're, they're a fixed amount. But it's it's fluid this one, Carl, and I'm not 
Well said. Well, no, I appreciate it. And that's I asked it in yeah. the context of the overall budget because. Mr. Boylan, sorry, could you speak to the mic? Sorry, yeah, sorry, sir. Um, just the DVA stuff. I mean, it, it's not even um, the issue of the, the lifts issue, but there's an amount of money there set aside for, for new test centres. And I mean, you, you, you mentioned climate uh, impact earlier on, and the, the issue for us was these new emission tests and whether the new centres are going to be set up for them. It's just obviously you have no detail on those issues at the minute. Maybe you could come back just, or somebody could come I'm back. Sure, just we'll, like. we'll, if you ask us, someone can come along and talk about it. And in relation to the new DVS centres itself and the emission tests, and obviously the lift issue that's going on at the minute, just I'll, just want to run that past the now because there's money. a further update in relation to um, DV. Well, there's money set aside for new centres, you know. <coughs> so, just want to be updated. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Gimmins. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to all for your presentation. I suppose. A lot of the points have been covered, but there's just a couple of things I wanted to ask um, in relation to the brief. And my colleague here had mentioned regarding community transport. Um, and I'm coming from, I suppose, a perspective I worked in older people's services for a long time. And one of the key issues, I suppose, in terms of community transport, you know, transport for, from hospital to home or between nursing homes and things like that, where we previously maybe would have been able to access community transport. And it's, you know, obviously the figures have shown there there's a 20% reduction in in the budget for that. Um, but I suppose, you know, in my experience over the last few years, we would have found where they would have suggested, you know, for example, if you have an older person with, you know, who's maybe being bed bound, can't really even use a wheelchair, um, that it would have been a, a suggestion to get a wheelchair taxi or things like that where family can't provide transport, but essentially they would need maybe like an ambulance type um, f uh, form of transport. You know, is there any scope to look at um, kind of working with the Department of Health on that? You know, to try and look at funding because I think, you know, I find that we, you know, we would have had to access ambulance um, at times, and you know, that's not always guaranteed. For for for, I know this is very specific to to a certain area, but I think it's it's a very important one because we have an aging population, and um, you know, where there's already huge strains in terms of um, the. Of, you know the the needs of older people and, and how we we um, address those, and I just think there's huge pressures on families and things like that in the community sector in relation to that. So, you know, would there be any scope to look at working with the Department of Health in terms of helping with funding those services so that there is we're not putting constraints on the, on the ambulance service and that there is a maybe community transport available for things like that where people don't have access um, to to the the transport they need, whether it's between hospital and home um, or from nursing homes and things like that and I'm also conscious suppose, there's a lot of people out there who don't have family and are completely reliant on on the pub, you know public services to, to help them um, and there's a huge dignity aspect to that as well and how they are transported you know I, I can give loads of examples but there's one in mind where I had a, a lady who was previously um, a case of mine and, and she was sent home from hospital on her own at three o'clock in the morning in a taxi you know, and things like that just aren't acceptable. So I know it's not uh, um, necessarily a remit, but it just in terms of community transport and it's, it's, it's under this department, I think it's something we could, um, and maybe, you know, we can look at as well as members, but if, if it hasn't already, you know, it's just to see if it ever, it's been explored. Um, under the road safety stuff, just an interesting point, I see the, the correlation there between collisions and budget expenditure um, and how we've, you know, we've noted that 2012 when there was quite a substantial um, expenditure on, on road safety advertising. Uh, you know, is there any evidence around the correlation between budget expenditure and road safety advertising and, and the number of, of fatalities? I see there that you've said that it was at an all-time low when the budget on road safety advertising was at a high. So it's just to kind of open that up a wee bit and see was there any other um, evidence around that because I, I, I do appreciate the importance of it, and I do think it, it is very effective in, in most cases. Um, <clears throat> there, there is some evidence of a correlation between the advertising and the scale of it and fatalities, mm -hmm. as we said earlier. It is driver behaviour that contributes to those yeah. things, so it is important. Though. We're constantly looking at the effectiveness. As I said, we know we shifted far more into social media because that's what people use these days, particularly perhaps younger drivers and stuff like that, and we're constantly, obviously, we had to do a budget cut a number of years ago, um, we haven't been able to supplement it at all since, if there was room to manoeuvre, I'm quite sure it would be in the Minister's list of priorities, but until we see 
the colour of the money at this minute. You know, but we have a very good team. You saw people here last week who are very inventive and do a lot of work and are very passionate about what they do. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the previous work about advertising around vote safety, a lot of the work that was done over the years here was actually groundbreaking. Now, admittedly, it's some very trenchant advertisements. Even some of them, I still close my eyes when they're coming up. And, and we do our best on it. And it, you know, successive ministers have always taken the view that you know they're also the road safety minister as well as the transport and the infrastructure minister. And I know my current minister has no less that view. <coughs> on the community transport, the point is constantly made, both by the operators and people like Age and I, that you know. A lot of people with health-related conditions are availing of community transport, which is true. Whether that gets us to the point, you know, we would get some of the health budget is a different matter mm -hmm. because I think in some cases the health budget is hard pressed, and therefore community transport is a good backup because it saves health trust money. I'm not being critical, therefore. But I know I think the minister may want at least to have some sort of dialogue with Minister Swan on the issue. Yeah. Um, clearly, community transport forms a valuable role. Um, it would be something the minister wants to look at. But again, we have to take money out of it. Many years ago, we haven't been able to put any back in. And I know a couple of partnerships are struggling in terms of maintaining some sort of decent service. We have to provide some in-year money last year, and it's something I want to take up with the minister where we go forward in that. But again, the headroom to do it may well not exist. Yeah, thank you. And I suppose uh, you know it's something as members we can we should be looking at as well. I definitely think there's a lot of things that are cross cutting, and it's important that everybody kind of plays their part. Uh, I suppose the last one, John, just is in relation to the section on walking and cycling, and I know the new decade, new approach deal it, it mentions the Sligo and Skill and Greenway, and um, which is a budget of 11 million. And, and I'm aware that the previous <coughs> minister, my colleague Chris Hazard, had launched a very comprehensive Greenway strategy that sought to create. Thousand kilometres of greenway um, over a 25-year period. One of very excellent one in my own constituency in Uri. Um, it's you know a great link up there to um, Carlingford and Meath. You know, so it's it's and hugely successful. Um, but I was just wondering, has the current minister has she identified any other greenway projects um, and active travel routes that she's willing to fund or are looking to to give consideration? She she hasn't got to that point of detail. Yeah. She clearly is very supportive of it. Yeah. Um, I think she hasn't got to the fine grain yet, and I've been careful saying, you know, I want that to happen. I spoke mm -hmm. to that because there are so many pressures at the minute. Therefore, I think she's been very careful not to signal anything until she knows she can afford it. But she is quite committed to the whole issue around greenways, active travel, um, improving people's lives, and these clearly do. Thank you. And I suppose just my last point then is in relation to the brief where it mentions the need for good quality and safe cycle routes, um, which is, is obviously very true. And it, it takes, I suppose, it takes people away from using their cars and things like that too. So there's a huge um, positive impact right across the board. Um, but it, it only mentions plans, I suppose, around Belfast. And I was just wondering, um, are there any plans to develop more separated cycle routes um, other, in other urban areas like in Derry and in, in Armagh, for example? Um, I think there's some thoughts about um, in the past the pattern has been we'd be looking to local government to take some of the lead on some okay. cycling routes outside Belfast. We will be, I think the Minister will want to put some fresh impetus into I mean, we see the traditional hierarchy perhaps where the, the driver, the car came tops and the pedestrian came last and the cycle was somewhere in the middle. We may be taking the views that that's the wrong way round, and that therefore it's about promoting walking as much as cycling. It's the way places work. It's taking cars out of uh, city centres. We're doing. We've done a piece of work in Belfast with uh, the Department for Communities and the City Council about what the city centre should look like in the future, how it should work, and a lot of that's conjecturing that you have more pedestrian areas, less cars in it, more people walking about, that whole so much. Um, I think the Minister is as much interested in the placemaking agenda yeah. and, and therefore what removes and walking, cycling, reducing car dependency can contribute to that, I mean, car dependency therefore reducing emission levels. 
was the quality issues as much as the, the hard work. Okay, thanks very much, John. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, in relation to the, the budget briefing, um, I think it would be probably fair to describe that a lot of this is rather grim. And I just don't know whether you. Would if it was me, I might say rather, as opposed <laughs> to just grim. Okay. <laughs> would you be? But do you think it would be fair to describe this as a funding crisis? Um, there are some areas that we talked about them where we are reaching crisis levels. Okay. Things happen. Okay. I mean, we're, we're trying to be um, straightforward and balanced about. And we're civil servants. We're good at this. About describing some of these issues, but in, in relation to the issues that. Mr. Beggs teased out the issue around Translink, and I'm sure you're familiar with it yourself, is reaching critical. It is, it's in, you know, on the risk register we have, it's red and it's throbbing red. You outlined when you were talking about that that this has been developing over a period of time. What contingencies have been built in to deal with this if this has been developing over a period of time? There aren't a huge amount of contingencies, <coughs> only because of the scale of the deficit. And also the fact, I mean, let, let's be clear, we run a fairly expansive public transport network, and I think you know all this, compared to elsewhere in these islands. I mean, we still run a good service in rural areas. It is important for people's lives and connectivity. People get to hospital appointments, people go to jobs, go to job interviews, go to college. If the public transport network fell away, particularly in rural areas, it would impact on the quality of life of lots and lots of people here. I think for, you know, it's not just a DFI issue. I mean, for example, if it went, the whole school transport arrangements would be in jeopardy because the Ulster Bus fleet does a lot of work moving kids in the morning and afternoons. Um, in terms of the deadlines to get a resolution of this, is it your view that uh, around April that there needs to be a clear I think, as I said, if Translink is faced with going into a new financial year, projecting a, a deficit of about £29 million, pounds, then that does bring some issues to the fore in terms of the auditor's view, as Mr. Begg said, the director's responsibilities, the whole issue of company law, trading insolvently, reputational damage, and you could just face issues of um, Supplier confidence. Okay. That's a matter of weeks, really. Do you know? In our view, it needs some resolution or certitude. Okay. You talked about the concessionary um, yep. bear scheme. Is your view that that's part of that is in danger as well as part of this? Well, it's. I, I can't comment on whether it's in danger. The concessionary bear scheme here is the most generous in these islands. It's more generous than anywhere else in the UK or in uh, the South. Um, the basic demographics, more of the population is elderly and they're living longer. So, you know, it's, it's not a genius to work out the expenditure on it. It's going to go like that. Mm. If the budget doesn't keep up with it, you end up with a gap. What one does about it is will be a matter for the minister or the minister, because again, the concessionary fair scheme makes a huge contribution to building social capital across. You know, in terms of the numbers and people getting out, a lot of this, if you look at a lot of the anecdotes around Glider and how you know, the elderly groups of people cross from one bit of Belfast to the other that they've never been for, you know, most of these people were concessionary first. It contributes a lot to the fabric of life here, and therefore we would have to be careful about making decisions on it. On the other hand, you get free transport up but once you pass 60. A lot of people are travelling to and from work for free. I think the issue is that there's two ways to sort of maybe construe this. One is the funding crisis, which you've outlined, but the other aspect is that, that last Monday we declared a climate emergency, and um, or the Monday before, uh, in the Assembly, and the whole focus is about how do we address climate change, and a key element of that is about investment in public transport, and it's just to understand what work has been done within government to make the case for investment in public transport, to view this as a positive thing that we need to be investing much more in public transport if we're going to address the climate emergency. Well, we do. I mean, in terms of the programme for government, um, we have an objective of increasing the numbers of public transport in the SRO for that one. You then overtake that with the climate change agenda and getting people out of cars, reducing emission levels, reducing congestion levels. It's all 
it's almost blindingly obvious it now, and it's important to do that. We still have a society that is wedded to the car. Um, I think we're making progress on it, but a lot of the climate change issues, you sort of get to a tipping point and suddenly it gets a bit easier to persuade people. I mean, there wasn't an issue about plastic a couple of years ago. <coughs> now everyone's fanatical about not having plastic straws, not doing this. We, we have mounted the arguments, we've mounted the whole case about public transport, but also you need investment. Lighter is a good example. If you ha it's, uh, my, it's a behavioural change. It's not just a rational argument to tell people you ought to be driving. You need something to trigger it. Lighter excites people. Yeah, in people going on to, tourists going on it just for the experience. In terms of that case for investment, do you think that's an adequately been made since we're in the financial situation we're in? Well, we have um, argued long and hard about investing in public transport. We do it. We do as much as we can. Um, equally, as I said, when we're looking at capital or minister looks, is it the water infrastructure? Is it the roads? Is it more roads we need? Um, is it... Um, <coughs> Buses? Is it real carriages? Is it the real? Sea? You know, all of these are important, and sometimes the public transport investment hasn't, in the past, been at the top of that. Later, it was. Later, two vehicles ahead in the um, city deal will be important. Um, and when we started later, we were facing a lot of issues about the bus lanes and the queues. And we said it would be nice when we get that the only complaints we have are from people who want later where they live. That was the issue. It's, we, we have made a point for investment. We will continue to make it. Transic um, makes it adequately. Transic has a whole set of proposals for bus replacement strategy based on low emissions. We had the launch of the hydrogen bus that you kind of a few years ago. But, there is. but sometimes you can have a credible, solid case, but there just isn't enough money. You know, that, that, and that's what we have. It's not about. Is this good value for money? Whether it's investments across the piece, is it? There's a limited amount of money, so what gets you to the top in, in the minister's judgment or executive's judgment? I understand that, but we're now in a situation of an absolute funding crisis for Translink and the public transport network in Northern Ireland have a state of collapse. And there, there really is a need to make that case for that investment in public transport, so we're not sitting here weeks away in that situation. Well, we now. have. I mean, the investment we're talking about is just. Is the money to keep the network going, and then, at your point, you would then want to say we want to improve the offer, we want to improve the kit, we want to change low emission buses, etc. We want better rail because um, we don't have enough space from the trains for the numbers we got. But we need to keep the basic fabric we have at the minute going to enable us to get in further new strategic investments. Yeah. This in relation to greenways, and as clear as a former councillor in Arjun North Danborough Council. I understand a lot of councils have progressed, a lot of those schemes ready for the application for funding, and it's just whether that funding is the idea is to secure that funding for next year so they can apply for that, because that will be match funding to be able to bring these schemes forward. Well, we had the possibility of a grant scheme. Some people have worked up sort of feasibility studies. Whether the minister wants to revive that scheme or do something different is still up in the air. But as I say, not knowing what the colour of our money is means uh, the minister is in no position at the minute to start saying I will do this and I will do that, and she's been very, uh, I think, prudent in not jumping the gun on any of these things. Last, just in relation to the um, MOT centres, which has been raised by Carl Boyle, um, has there been any consideration for the change in terms of the fees that have been charged for MOTs? Because we understand that they have remained static for the last number of years. I don't. I'm not cited in that one, Andrew. I say there's a lot going on at DVA, which my colleague Julie Thompson is covering, um, and the minister is um, heavily occupied with it. So I, I, I can't today. Auntie, I'll give you an answer on that one. Okay, thank you. Just, just before we call Ms Kelly, is there our, for the last question? Um, I just want to return to, the, and I suppose the commentary in relation to director's responsibility and Translink concerns me a little bit. Um, and I suppose. The, the point would be that we went back, if you go back to 2015, TransLink did have reserves of 56.7 million. And I know at that stage, obviously, the department were tightening their belts as well. And some could say perhaps that the department looked quite jealously on the fact that TransLink had those reserves. And by perhaps not upholding the department's end of the agreement with TransLink, 
they were allowing then TransLink then to contribute to the overall department's pot. Um, and perhaps at that stage, and, and while it's become very evident to us over the last couple of years that TransLink now are in this position, that really the position that they're currently in is really the department's fault as opposed to TransLink and particularly the director's fault. So I am yeah. just a wee bit concerned in relation to if we were in a position where we're talking about insolvency and so on, that there's a responsibility on the directors. They're in this position of, by no fault of their well, own. Well, that's why I made the point. This is not an issue of TransLink management. But members have made point, but directors, you know, have a responsibility, a degree of responsibility, and therefore they cannot be seen to trade when they're not, or, or that there's issues on it. That that the issue is it puts them in a really <coughs> invidious position, which is not of their making. They're absolutely clear in that, um, but it's still the, because they are directors of the company. So it's unfortunate and. Um, the uh, um, directors, um, I mean, I have a, a new um, interim chair, have made that point. Yeah, no, I, I'm just, I just want to add that to that because I am a bit concerned about some of the commentary in relation to I know, some I'm, of this it, and the, the difficulties that, and the pressures that that will obviously put on, on no, individuals at this that's, particular that's, time. And that's right. But the other point, well, is if we hadn't had this issue, then Transic had reserved, that money would have been invested in. And public transport schemes, self-finance investment by transit. So, you know, 30, 40 million pounds of capital, which could have gone into new buses and stuff like that, has been foregone to, just to keep the ticking over because we have been enabled to put in adequate funding. So, there's a, a big opportunity cost of of that. Appreciate that. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Kelly. Thanks, Chair, and thanks for your presentation. I I would hope then uh, that the new executive will have a different approach to infrastructure than the previous one. And obviously, the three years of collapse hasn't helped the situation in relation to budgetary pressures. But can I ask around concessionary fares? Uh, you uh, have made the comments, as have others and members of the committee, included around the social capital. It's just to understand: is the concessionary uh, fares a ring-fenced fund allocated? from the executive to Department of Infrastructure, or is it on a, just as dependent on, on, on usage? It's not depending on usage. I mean, essentially, we have a budget of £40 million, but because our budget is stood still, it's, so what, £40 million just about covered it in, say, 14, 15. So we haven't been able to add to the 40 because we have no headroom, whereas demand has, you know, predictably gone up. And that's the way that there's a differential, but we, we don't have the eight or nine million pounds now to supplement that budget. But you know, others have made comment that you know, it is cross cutting, you know, and, and it is a very good argument in terms of how it does get people mm. moving yes, and uh, able to visit family, etc., and enrich his lives. So uh, I'm just interested uh, in terms of the executive's approach to the concessionary fares, is it something then that the executive? Uh, you believe or has to date uh, valued and therefore resourced uh, or sought to well obviously if it stood still it hasn't helped an awful lot but and, and then how you had also said about how it's uh, one of the most generous across these islands i don't know whether we have any comparative tables around that or whether that could be provided to us to see it might be of interest but it is something that people will worry about you know i mean people will want to see we, this we'll, we'll be happy. but i mean we have a gap at the minute if the scheme remains as it is, the cost will just keep going up because there's more people living, That's they're right. getting more people out. The cost will go up, even in our view, even to be able to keep it at this level would need something done with it, or else people recognise the huge social value of this and getting people out and about mm -hmm. um, and recognise that probably if you didn't have it, the cost of that might be greater than finding the money to balance it. But equally, it is demand-led, and what's 48 now, it might be 58 in four or five years' time. So, in a tight budget thing, I don't know what the executive's collective view on this will be, since we're only a matter of weeks in and they're looking. But clearly, when you're looking at a programme for government and all the cost-cutting issues, the impact, just as the talk about the public transport network, the impact of this being curtailed could have could run across a number of departments. 
Uh, the other chair that they wanted to ask was around some of the expertise. I know when speaking to people on the ground uh, in terms of contractors and subcontractors, because of the uncertainty of funding in the Department of Infrastructure, I'm told uh, that has been very difficult. When you did get a pot of money to fix a bit of road or maintenance, there weren't the, the contractors there. Many of them gone to England and Scotland and, and Donegal, I was told. So there is some uh, North West uh, development, but it's in County Donegal. I, I know, and colleagues can talk about it, but I know in certain cases. Um, you know, contractors have decided they're going to go into another business because our business dropped off. And, you know, the amount of money we spend on road maintenance and resource dropped significantly and instead low down. The business that they could look forward to previously mm -hmm. disappeared or it was uncertain. They needed, you know, they needed income to keep their workforces going, so they maybe just decided they were getting they were getting out of the tarmacking business and something, mm -hmm. and that's and that's the case. Well, should you should the department be so fortunate in having a huge investment in the incoming budget? You know, have you any concerns, or have you entered into dialogue with the industry uh, to say well, that we are? Um, and I know my my rose colleagues on board are in constant dialogue. We work very closely with the industry because the point you made is well made. You know, there's no point in having money if you can have somebody who can do the work for you. Mm -hmm. So and that is flagged up frequently by Gordon Best and others. Mm -hmm. So we work very closely. Industry capability and capacity is important to us. But equally if we didn't have the money to spend we, you know we can't magic it. Uh, the, the, you're confident though that should there, there are shovel ready projects and hopefully some mm -hmm. uh, People within the well, industry, well, the, the, the issue is mainly on the resource side, where we've, we're spending dramatically less on road maintenance than we were with damage. You know, as I said, we're still spending in capital terms more than any other department. We spend our money; we don't surrender mm -hmm. because we get it spent. So we're, we're spending two million a week in the A6 at the minute. We're very efficient in getting it done. Yeah. Um, I think some of the smaller contractors who would have done the, the basic road maintenance may have, as you say, gone out of that business or. Gone elsewhere. Whether you get them back is a different matter, but that, that was a, a, a macro issue for the construction industry after the recession. Anyway, a lot of them, most of their work is not here anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there, there was uh, something you'd said there actually that drew it to me. Uh, yeah, um, traditionally, uh, your department would have ha had expectations of in year monitoring rounds and from sort of late, win or late uh, November onwards. But that seems to have diminished year on year. Would that be a true observation? Well, I think um, it's always been an ambition of the executive and departments that you spend your money better, therefore you don't have surrenders. We used to be the department that um, soaked up other surrenders. If mm -hmm. at all. But as I keep saying, you need somebody to surrender it for you to get it in the first place. And if other departments are getting better, which they are, and that's a good thing, mm -hmm. there's less. And we would make the point, and it's made, point was made back when Mike Kenny was the minister. You know, having a funding strategy for us dependent on giving us late year money is not a sensible way of planning your no. work. And, like, and one of my few technical bits on this, is, you know, if you're putting tarmac down in the winter, it's not as effective as if you put it down in the summer. You know, so there, it, there's an on cost. Andrew Murray can t tell you that in detail. It's one of my little snippets I've brought on that. So it, it's not just. <laughs> You know, it doesn't matter when you spend the money. It does matter when you spend the money, and we really we welcome any late year additions, but we'd like that to be on top of a, a decent opening allocation of some things, not relying on a drip feed. And as you say, there's less of it, and yet I know, in a sense, I would have colleagues who perhaps were conditioned to getting a lot of money in the year and therefore yes. assumed it would come, and then when it doesn't come on that scale, you know, it doesn't fit their sort of. Rules of engagement, and we can see that in the roads maintenance budget in particular. I think. Well, the roads maintenance is, 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 I mean, it, it is not good what we're doing, and the problem is particularly because because the main motorways and some of the main roads are looked after by PPE contracts. The maintenance there is guaranteed because it's in the contract. So it is the lesser roads and the rural roads and all who are <coughs> suffering. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm very conscious of the time that we've we've had. So, but and Mr. Boylan, it has to be really, really brief. Sure, it, it's, really, it's, really, it's really important because uh, you, yourself, you've asked that in relation to Transnic itself. Um, if they don't get the money, there's a shortfall of 20. Is the department in breach of contract, or what way is that model set up? That's a good question. I mean, 
There are two issues. One, we have a legal obligation, the Transport Act, to maintain Transic as a going concern, and we also have a public service agreement with them, the EU agreement, which really says, you know, here's the money we give you, and here's the network you deliver to us. It is, by nature, of a contract. That's another two years ago, and there'll be a renewal, which hopefully will be an issue the committee will spend time on. In, in spirit, we are sort of breaching the contract. I mean, if you look at it, just we're not subsidising giving the subsidy for uneconomic routes they're running, and we're also now not refunding them for the concessionary for ours, which they simply act as an agent for us. It, it may be more than just not in spirit. In this instance, well, but, 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 possibly. Um, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you very yeah. much. Thank you. 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 January monitoring spend and also the additional money which was um, allocated this week and how that's going to be spent um, over the, the next number of weeks if you're content that we do that. Um, any other and just the clarity, questions? sorry I know you couldn't hear the mic, but the clarity on the DVA because it's in the page one two four but for you then cheers thank you. Useful. Thank we you. have really run over our time um, today. Um, we have two further briefings. Just, um, just before we go on, I think it's important that we do get an answer of what is going to happen in public transport. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's it's important that we are aware of what, what is What's going to going happen. On? It's either going to be uh, left to the company to bust or the company to take the decision to cut routes in perhaps an unplanned fashion that the department yes. is not involved in or additional money is going to be gone. We need to know and we that have the department is at ministers are on this and, and the rest of the executive is aware of it as well. I think this is something we've probably raised every week since we've been here in relation yeah. to that. But we also yeah, but have the, the, breach, have the breach of contract issues. Yeah, but we also have transfer. Companies to each other while they go bust. Well, I suppose that was really the point that I was trying to make in relation to them taking. They weren't. They weren't. Um, you know, they, they looked at them quite jealously on the reserves and, and used the opportunity to get that money reduced. But um, they do they are coming up to see us the week after next. Okay. Um, so there'll be a lot of questions going to translate at that opportunity as well. But we can ask for um, in the meantime any further information that they have. Um, I did want to put it to members we have two further briefings. Um, we have a briefing from um, from water and drainage on water and drainage policy and also on planning. Um, I'm going to ask whether we should kindly ask um, officials for the third briefing if they might want to come up next week. If if members are well, I think uh, myself and Mr. Buchanan have assembly commission at one o'clock. Yeah. So, do you, will we ask ask officials if they could be avail make themselves available for next week? Would you be content that we do uh, that? Great, Your great. commission. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, no, it's Kelly. Okay. So if we if we move then on to our our next briefing, which is on water and drainage policy and um, living with water program, and again Hansard will report the meeting. Again, I'm, I'm mindful of time and that other members have committees after this. If we could keep our questions, and I'll, I'll apply this to myself as well, um, rather than having monologues, that we maybe have um, shorter questions so that we can put as much to officials as we possibly can in, in the time that we have allocated. Um, just if you turn to page 128, we'll find the briefing paper from there on. And I'd like to welcome Linda McHugh, the Director of Water and Drainage Policy, Simon Richardson, Director of Living with Water Policy, and Damien Curran, Head of Shareholder Unit. So thank you very much for coming to meet with us today, and apologies for the delay. Obviously, there was a lot of interest in, in the previous briefing, and quite a lot of the questions actually were probably yes. associated to what you're going to speak to us today on. So if you'd like to make an opening statement, yes. then we'll follow up with questions. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. No, everyone, they're indicating my for. All right, sorry, right. Okay. <laughs> sorry, so thank you, Chair, um, for this opportunity to present an overview of my areas of responsibility um, as Director of Water and Drainage Policy in the Department. Um, and I'm here with uh, Simon Richardson, who 
He uh, heads up the Living with Water programme, and his work and mine really dovetail. So um, we're going to do a, a sort of a joint presentation, and then um, I'm joined by one of my staff, Damien Curran, who is responsible for managing the relationship with Northern Ireland Water and the shareholder unit in the department. So, as director of Water and Drainage Policy, I'm responsible for both the oversight of Northern Ireland Water, and then also for policy and legislation relating to. Uh, flooding, drainage, and the operation of water and sewage services here. Um, so, turning first to Northern Ireland Water, um, you're probably aware, but um, it was set up under the Water and Sewage Services Order as both a regulated utility and a government-owned company. Um, and DFI is the sole shareholder of that company. But because it still receives over 50% of its funding from uh, government sources, it is also classified as a non-departmental public body. <coughs> so, um, in terms of accountability and governance, it's kind of riding three horses, and that's complicated. Um, and the NDPB status comes with um, a lot of financial restrictions that a normal water utility would not face. So that's all resulted in a very complex funding and accountability uh, framework and arrangements. And I and my team work very closely with both Northern Water and its statutory regulators, which is the utility regulator, um, the Environment Agency, the Drinking Water Inspector, and the Consumer Council. And we all have to function and perform our, our respective roles um, in, in managing and, and, and in, in the oversight of Northern Water. Um, Northern Water operates under price controls, which are essentially really major six-year business plans which are agreed with the regulator and indeed the utility regulator and all the other regulators. Um, and the current price control, which um, we refer to as piece 15, ends in March 2021. And we've been working very closely with Northern Water and the regulators for some time now on the plan for the next price control, PC21, which runs from uh, April 2021 to March 2027. We have, um, in the department, developed draft social and environmental guidance, which sets out priorities for investment for Northern Water. And the regulator will have regard for that document um, in the price control process. And that draft is now with our minister for consideration. Um, and whilst investment figures will only really finally be known once the utility regulator publishes its final determination in December of this year, it's clear that um, from Northern Water's initial assessment that the level of funding required for, for PC21 will be significantly higher than in the current price control. And at present, DFI cannot afford to fully fund that, as you've already heard this morning. And the impact of underfunding has been particularly felt on the wastewater side of the business. And you will be aware of the increasing numbers of areas where Northern Ireland water systems are at or near capacity. Um, those areas are widespread and throughout Northern Ireland um, and are of concern. Um, and Simon here is going to be talking you through the specific um, issues in, in Belfast shortly. Um, the recognition of the need to address this underfunding and the commitments made in the new decade new approach agreement are welcome. And my minister is now discussing with executive colleagues how those commitments can be honoured. In terms of my policy and legislation responsibilities, there's a range of areas that we're working in. Um, sustainable water, a long-term water strategy for Northern Ireland, is the current executive strategy that balances all of our water needs and also promotes a sustainable and integrated approach to managing water in and through our environment. And that document forms the basis for a lot of the policy development work that we're currently undertaking. And we're also responsible for monitoring that strategy's progress. My team is in the lead in developing and reporting on flood risk management plans on a six-year cycle. And that's a statutory requirement under the EU Floods Directive, which has now been transposed into, into Northern Ireland law. Um, and so the first cycle of flood risk management plans um, that we're currently in runs from 2015 to 2021, again a six-year cycle. And we're now working um, quite intensively on developing the second cycle. There's a number of stages in that cycle's development, again set out in legislation, and we've successfully completed the first two of those on time. So those were identifying areas of potential significant flood risk, and then reviewing and updating the flood risk and flood hazard maps for those areas. And whilst the plans for the next cycle will still cover the three key principles in flood risk management, which are prevention, protection and preparedness, there are some changes in approach in the next cycle. 
um, which will focus much more on the impact of climate change and flooding um, created by surface water. They will also take account of existing flood defences, which have not been factored into the first series of plans. Um, those plans um, are due to go to public consultation at the end of this year, and clearly, um, as they emerge, we will be coming to brief you on those plans. And, um, in the meantime, we have also amended the Northern Ireland regulations to make sure that they are still operable um, now that we have left Europe. Um, one particular area of flooding policy is reservoirs. Now, again, you will be aware that the Reservoirs Act was unfortunately left off the transfer of functions order when the then Rivers Agency moved into DFI in 2016. And so, by fault, um, that act is still with DERA. And we have been working with DERA um, to start the transfer process um, to get that legislation back where it belongs um, so that our minister can then move forward um, on the regulations needed to implement the key elements of that act. Um, and those regulations will be coming to this committee in, uh, for scrutiny in, in due course. Um, my team is also responsible for a, a range of other policy areas relating to water and drainage. Um, so, quite quickly, through those, we are working with DERA and local government and other stakeholders to encourage the greater use of sustainable drainage systems, um, commonly known as SUDs. Um, and these either return rainwater to the environment directly through natural means. Um, rather than putting it down the drains and then overwhelming the drains, or they hold back rainwater so that they don't overwhelm the sewage system and, and cause out a sewer flooding, which is really unpleasant. Um, these are becoming <coughs> ever more important as the impacts of urbanisation and climate change are felt, and there are more instances of very heavy rain over short periods. We've legislated um, in the last um, uh, mandate. We legislated for suds. Um, hard suds, which are usually oversized pipes or tanks with flow control mechanisms. And it's good to see that that has um, increased the number of planning applications coming forward that have a suds element in them. But we're now working to increase the number of soft suds. So those are more natural features designed to hold back water in the environment. Um, and they not only deal with the, the problems of stormwater, but they can also bring added environmental health and social benefits, particularly in urban environments. So it's something that we're, we're trying to encourage more of. Um, within the DFI family itself, we've been working collaboratively, collaboratively in dealing with difficult flooding problems, and we continue to explore how the three drainage authorities within the DFI family can work in a more integrated and effective way when dealing with surface water. And Simon will be talking more about the work he's doing and under the Living with Water programme um, on that. Um, we're also scoping out a possible water and drainage bill that would provide both Northern Ireland Water and DFI rivers with more effective powers to adapt to climate change and to adopt more sustainable approaches to both water and drainage. And we're seeking the Minister's views at, at present on what legislation she would like to take forward. And finally, then, we support the work of the Coastal Forum. This was set up in 2015 to explore how we can address problems of coastal erosion, um, and it's jointly chaired by DFI and DERA. And its members are the, those two departments, the seven councils that have a coastline, and the National Trust, which also has a significant interest in, in the coast. And unlike other parts of these islands, um, no department here has statutory responsibility for coastal erosion, which is part of the issue. Um, in DFI, we have responsibility for um, coastal flooding, and either the department or its ALBs um, have a significant amount of, of infrastructure along the coast, so we clearly have an interest in it. Um, DERA has responsibility for marine planning and marine environment, and we have been collectively pooling our, our current diaries to see how we can move the debate forward and, and figure out what, what actually needs to be done to properly manage coastal erosion here. Um, we commissioned a baseline study, which completed just over a year ago, and um, that was that was aimed at figuring out, you know, what what position we're in, what parts of the coastline are vulnerable, and where do we need to focus our, our energies. And I suppose the outcome of that report was that we actually needed to do an awful lot more work to to get the baseline to a position where we could take really informed um, uh, decisions on that. Um, and so we're working through the coastal forum to see how, how can we do that. And we're clearly also now taking our minister's mind on how she sees that work going forward. So that's a very brief overview of some of the main areas of my responsibility. And I'm going to now hand over to Simon, who's going to talk about the Living Water Programme.
Okay, thanks, Linda. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Simon Richardson, and I'm the director of the Living with Water program in the department. Um, the Living with Water program was established as a multi-agency initiative headed by the department to deliver a new, integrated, long-term strategic approach to drainage provision. The core objectives of the program are to provide drainage and wastewater treatment infrastructure needed to protect against flooding, enhance the environment, and enable economic growth. As we know, the capacity of our sewers and wastewater treatment facilities is placing constraints in development in Belfast and across Northern Ireland. And while there is certainly a need to improve and upgrade this hard infrastructure, we must also change how we manage rainwater on the surface to try and reduce flooding and control the volume of surface water getting into the combined sewer network. The focus for the Living with Water programme is on developing integrated catchment-based solutions to manage rainwater on the surface through the use of blue-green infrastructure. Blue infrastructure includes features that retain water, such as detention basins, ponds and wetlands. And green infrastructure applies to the natural land or can be plant-based, including woodlands, green open space and parks. Both types of infrastructure are designed to attenuate flow before it enters, enters a water course. Using green space to manage surface water and implement a more natural approach to drain, urban drainage enables water to be controlled closer to the source. This reduces the, the, the chances of traditional drainage systems becoming overwhelmed. Blue-green solutions are more sustainable and environmentally friendly than hard engineered drainage solutions, and they also offer the opportunity to provide improved community space in urban areas. The new approach is being taken forward through the development of a strategic drainage infrastructure plan for Belfast and through the development of guidance for integrated drainage investment plans in other parts of Northern Ireland. The Strategic Drainage Infrastructure Plan for Belfast covers the six wastewater treatment works and their associated drainage catchments that input to Inner Belfast Lock. Much of the detailed work to scope the required hard engineering upgrades is being done by NA Water as part of their PC21 process, which Linda has touched on, and it's anticipated that the regulator will issue its PC21 draft determination in July this year. In the interim period, the Living with Water programme team will continue to work with key stakeholders to identify and assess potential blue-green opportunities that may deliver significant drainage improvements. The draft plan for Belfast is scheduled to be completed in September this year, and it is proposed to commence formal public consultation in the autumn, with the final plan to be brought to the Executive for approval in early 2021. Current estimates are that the Belfast Strategic Drainage Plan alone will cost approximately £1.45 billion. Pounds to deliver over the next 13 years. This includes the sewer and wastewater upgrades proposed by NA Water and the blue-green infrastructure opportunities identified in the catchment analysis. This is over and above NA Water's business-as-usual funding needs for PC21 and PC27 for drinking water and wastewater outside Belfast. The challenge we face, as you have heard this morning, under current funding models is that funding our drainage and wastewater infrastructure has to be considered alongside other capital priorities across the public sector when budgets are being determined. A number of organisations have key roles to play in managing the flow of water, including Northern Ireland Water, DFI Roads, DFI Rivers, DERA and local councils. But in addition to these organisations, there is an extensive network of private drainage infrastructure that links streams, drains and sewers, which is the responsibility of individual landowners. Each of the key stakeholders have well-established roles and responsibilities. However, there are many gaps in the drainage infrastructure, which cause great difficulty when trying to solve flooding problems in an integrated way. A fundamental part of the Living with Water programme is bringing together all of the key stakeholders to work collaboratively to deliver genuine integrated solutions that are efficient and sustainable. This collaboration has been established through the Living with Water programme. However, much work is still required to deliver effective outcomes on the ground, which will improve our drainage capacity. Chair, that concludes my short update on the Living with Water and also concludes our joint presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is probably a general lack of understanding of the amount of money that is required to process what is a natural resource, um, although there probably is not a lack of there is you know, very clear opinions as to why um, water should be funded, whether or not it should be charged or not, so everyone has an opinion with regards to that. Um, but, but setting that aside, I think we do have, and there's a political realisation that, that there is investment required, particularly in, in the sewerage system, and that the challenge is that there are not only in Belfast, but right across Northern Ireland, and we all have issues in, large, in relation to developments and so on. 
You've, you've touched on the complexities in relation to Northern Ireland Water uh, and how it's funded and, it, and its, its status as an NDPB. What serious consideration has the department given to other options of funding for Northern Ireland Water? Yeah, I mean, we have done some scoping work on that. We couldn't just sit back knowing the, the gap was widening and widening, widening so considerably. Um, I suppose the answer is that there are no easy answers, um, you know, and this is highly political. Um, to give Northern Ireland Water the ability to look outside government for funding, we would need to release them from an awful lot of our control. Um, and that would come with some very difficult decisions that are political. And so our minister is discussing that with executive colleagues. Um, and it's something that, you know, as, as officials, all we can do is highlight the level of funding required and provide um, those that need to take decisions with um, evidence and, and, and options, but there are no easy answers to this one. And how advanced are those options? Um, we have spoken to our minister um, about some of the work that we've done. Uh, we've looked at you know, how other um, water companies work, Scottish Water, Welsh Water, um, but they all come with water charging, and you know that is at the moment not politically acceptable here. Um, so there are, um, I mean, I suppose it's going to be a political decision then about how the, the, the Northern Bloc could get enough money, the money required, to be able to fund the level of funding that um, Northern Water needs, particularly not on its wastewater. You know, because. There has been underfunding. Um, they have had to protect drinking water, which I think everybody accepts. You cannot compromise the, the quality of drinking water. Um, and that's why now um, it's built up this by wave of problems on the wastewater side, where there are more and more areas where, where they're at their capacity. Okay. Uh, obviously, Ms. Simon, you've been working with um, the Living Water Programme, um, and you've suggested this figure of 1.45 billion. Over, over 13 years, and that's over and above obviously what's required um, for um, sort of normal working practice. Um, what sort of scoping has been done with regards to the amount of, amount of money that would need to be on a sort of the an an annual basis? If it's over 13 years, obviously, that sounds a considerable amount of money, but it's obviously going to be something which is phased. Yes. Um, can you maybe talk to us about the approach that's being taken around that? Yep. In relation to the NI water work, um, on the hard engineered uh, solutions that will be required, and that will be done through the PC21 process and subsequently the next PC price control period, which is PC27. Um, and obviously, there's a there's a profile through that. Alongside the hard engineering work, where we within the Living with Water program are looking at the the uh, blue green infrastructure that we can provide, and it really is. Uh, essential that we work collaboratively with all partners who are investing in communities because this any opportunity that there, that organizations are working within a community there is a possibility that we can use the green space to develop um, attenuation ponds to reduce uh, the flow of water through a catchment area which then um, doesn't allow the combined sewer network to be overflowed, and it does, means the combined sewer overflows don't don't discharge as often as they could. So there's a there is a huge parallel working between b b the hard engineering and the the uh, um, the blue green infrastructure. And over that period, you know we have we have profiled that work. Then there will be a ramp up in the first two to three years of PC21 to get to a level both on the blue green side and on the NI water side. Uh, to allow us to work, to work through that, but the, the 1.45 billion includes the wastewater uh, hard, hard engineering solutions that NA Water will require to in Belfast, and the blue associated blue green um, opportunities that we we may develop over that time to try and assist with the uh, you know you know with the water flow through the catchments. Um, has there been a has the department perhaps been taking their eye off the ball a little over the years by not insisting and perhaps not working with colleagues in planning to insist on greater developer contributions, particularly around some of our, our towns and villages? I'm very mindful of my own, my own area as well, um, and where we have a, a situation where we are starting to creak with our capacity. 
Yeah, developer contributions, I mean, that's something that's driven through the planning process. Um, we also have the complication of the regulatory process. So the regulator works on the basis that um, water and sewage is paid for by customers. Now, because of government policy, the domestic part of that is paid by government. But So they're blind, really, to, to, to where the money comes from. Um, we're looking at whether or not Northern Water could accept direct contributions from developers. Um, but there is an argument that I think the regulator would make that, you know, you're asking a developer to pay for a specific part of a development that's, that's part of a wider network. That said, I mean, we are, uh, both Northern Water and the department, we're working increasingly with developers to look at more sustainable ways of taking stormwater out of the system. And that actually is, is very encouraging. Um, you know, in some areas, Northern Water might be able to, to connect the file supply, but they couldn't connect the, the, the additional stormwater because that is what would overwhelm. So we can find better ways of designing developments so that there's, say, a soft suds pond or that there's um, uh, sustainable uh, drainage um, put in at, at individual property level, then you'll have less stormwater coming through. Now, it's not going to solve every single problem, but it will certainly help. And as I said, I'm encouraged that um, developers are starting to knock on our door saying, can we work with you on this? Um, so that's the direction of travel that we'd really like to go in. Okay, thank you. Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation. Linda, yeah. you're welcome back. And thank you. you. Has to, um, just a couple of interesting points. I mean, it's all right talking about developer contributions, which is a planning issue that yeah. we get in the next briefing, but um, ultimately people will pay for that. So, mm -hmm. which we say the developer contributes, that price will be put on elsewhere. And yeah. That's another debate for another day. The, the issue, I like the idea of the suds, which yes. you mentioned, but what statute is that? You said that was legislated because... Are yeah. we clearly saying that now that uh, councils have those powers, planning powers, is that within now the remit of the development itself? Mm. That they have to apply those. No, so there's several points to that. So what we legislated for was that Northern Water could um, adopt hard suds, so that they become part of a drainage system, mm -hmm. because previously they, they could only adopt pipes and yeah. things. So. Uh, they also have the right to refuse um, an Article 161, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the Serbon thing, um, if a developer has not given due regard to putting suds in. So, um, you know, it, it's kind of driving um, uh, more developers to look at suds as a solution. Um, but then over and above that, um, within the, the planning system, and, and my colleagues in planning will, will be a lot more um, okay with this, but you know, there are clear statements made in the strategic, strategic planning policy statement about sustainable drainage um, being a preferred option. And we've done an awful lot of work um, recently, over the last year or two, with councils as they look towards their local development plans and looking at their own local planning policies to ensure that water and drainage is, is adequately reflected in those plans and that when they're developing their own local planning policies that, that you know, the strength uh, of some of our policies in the strategic planning policy statement and the PPS is below that isn't lost, both actually for SUDS and also for, for flood prevention. And, and flood mitigation. But my point is, in terms of the hard and soft yeah. sides, the options, are we now integrating that as part of the whole planning policy? Or is that, do I need to ask that question to planning service? Um, is that yeah, well, it, it's intrinsic in, right. in, in planning policy. Um, and as I said, we've been working with councils to ensure that as, as they move forward with their local policies, that, that that's not lost. Because I know some developments develop these spec tax to deal with maybe a certain number of houses. Mm -hmm. We don't want to load them all over the place either. We need a, a proper system. But mm. and, and, and this is an argument for another day. Just two quick points. In the first day brief we got to send you were discussion you you discussion with the finance minister in terms of how this new model or how you could bring mm. funding to to deliver the program uh, PC twenty one or whatever it is. Um, you were to bring options back to the minister. Mm -hmm. Can you expand a wee bit on what those options are or not really at the moment. I mean, as I said, all I, all I can say is that, you know, when we've looked at them, um, there are no quick and easy answers. And in terms of the governance model, uh, the GOCO, is, is there any flexibility within that model itself to borrow funding, or can you expand, can you say that? 
Um, <clears throat> well, as, a, as an NDBB, um, Lord on the Water is um, exclusively has to borrow from, from the department. Yeah. Um, flexibilities around borrowing um, really need to be probably sort of cost of business case out. You know, if you look at managing public money in Northern Ireland, um, there is statements in there in terms of you know borrowing outside from the market, for example, needs to be you know business case that needs to prove a value for money case. Uh, but borrowing from government is, uh, if you compare it to the market, it's uh, generally always a lot more competitive, uh, always uh, beneficial and less risky. And actually, it's not access to borrowing that's the problem for Northern Ireland Water. It's budget cover to spend the money. So um, we have um, a, um, a borrowing agreement where Northern Water can borrow up to a certain limit for capital. They are nowhere near that limit. But they can't get to the limit because we have to restrict the amount of budget cover we can give them to spend the capital. So it, it's it, it's it's bizarre. So it's in the contract. It's, it's in the overall model. Yeah, it, it, I mean, be it contractual or, or yeah. governance. Yeah. And it's it's a very very complicated situation. Yeah. But you know, access to money isn't no matter what's problem. Their problem is that we cannot provide them with enough budget cover to spend the money that they need to spend. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you, Ms. Cummins. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, it's just a, a couple of small points, I suppose, in terms of the assessment of the current flood risk management plans. Mm -hmm. And obviously, funding is a huge issue here, and, it, and it's right across the board as well. Um, I suppose, how prepared are we? I'm speaking in terms of recently, I, my, I was on Nearly Morning Down Council yes. up until very, very recently, and I know um, my colleagues had a presentation there in the last number of weeks from NI Water. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the key issues they pointed out was. That the capacity of the infrastructure in that area is mm -hmm. it's it's you know it's a breaking point. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned there, Linda, about the local development plans in terms of working along with councils. Yes. It has been brought to my attention too that it could actually hinder mm -hmm. uh, further development in that area. You know, mm -hmm. with it, as you know, Newry itself is a very huge yes. flood risk. You know, as we've seen over the yes. last number of years, and Simon will be well aware of that too. Um, so it was really just to see where we are with that, how yeah. prepared are we in terms of managing that going forward. You know, obviously we want to ensure that we can um, continue with future development in, in, mm. in all areas, mm. but we also have a, a duty to make sure we protect people's homes and the communities yes. that are existing. Yeah, and so um, you know, I suppose it, it, it's one of the big challenges with flood risk management planning. You know, you cannot plan for every single event, and all we can do is you know, use our knowledge and our technology to identify those areas that are at most risk, and then prioritise those areas for investment. Um, now, um, but that, that doesn't say that we can protect everybody and everything from flood. And you only have to look at what's happening in England and Wales at the moment. And you know, I think. We got off. I know my colleagues on DFI Rivers had a very hairy weekend. The weekend before last, I don't think there was much sleep. Um, and so, you know, we do have issues here. But when you look at the scale and the size, I think part of it is luck that just that rain didn't fall on us. And also, I think part of it is that we have far less of a percentage of properties at flood risk here because we've had fairly stringent planning policies around flood risk. And I think that has to do us in good stead. Now, the flip side of that is, of course, that in some areas um, where people want to develop, they're told, well, actually, that's a floodplain. And if, yeah. you, if you build there, you're likely to get flooded. And then there's an issue about if you allow, allow development there. And is that right when then government have to step in and, and try to protect it? And if you protect one area, you actually could compound flood risk further downstream. So it's a really, really difficult area of work and, and complex and quite technical at times. Um, but as I said, you know, the, the, the current um, uh, plans um, really started to look at where we needed to prioritise and do work. Um, the next set will focus a lot more on, on surface water, and it'll bring in all of the issues that, that Northern Water has highlighted. And you know, on one hand, we're saying to them, you will have to play a much bigger role in flood risk management than you did in the last plans. And the next breath saying, but by the way, we can't fully fund you, and that's actually a difficult position for the department to be in. Yeah, yeah, and it's in, as you said there, in terms of planning, and, and it is something that has come up through planning in our own council there. Um, you know, 
Newry is an example. The topography is against us. We're in a valley, so you know the yeah. centre of Newry, where we're looking to develop, and obviously we're on the cusp of something very good for that area mm. in terms of the potential for tourism and, and all yeah. of those different things. With lots of different things coming down the line, hopefully, mm-hmm. um, it is quite worrying. So it's mm-hmm. it's something I suppose. I know my colleague had mentioned in the previous um, presentation about the infrastructure plans in terms of wastewater being seem to be very Belfast centric. It's something I've, ma- I've mentioned with the minister. Yeah because I think the likes of Newry, and I know there's other areas and I can't quote them here directly, but I know just from from my own um, knowledge that it is one of the, the, the huge problems yeah. right across the north. And I, I mean, um, I can reassure you that um, in terms of business planning, you know, Northern Water is looking at um, a, a lot of areas outside Belfast. It's, yeah. it's absolutely not just in Belfast. Okay. Um, uh, in, their recent plan, which they put into the um, regulator, there's 12 economic hubs um, that they are also going to be concentrating on outside Belfast, as well as some smaller areas too. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's really not just Belfast centric. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. And in fact, Yuri is one of them. That's good. <laughs> as, Glad as to hear that. Caring. Oh, yeah, well, that's recorded. <laughs> that's recorded. That's that 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 but I must caution that's based on them getting <laughs> funding. Yeah. You know? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Chair. You're very welcome, Linda. Good to Thank see you, you again today. Uh, just moving to another topic there in relation to your presentation the Coastal Forum and your input yeah. into that. I know it's pretty sort of worrying that nobody has any clear responsibility <coughs> in that area, mm. but coming from a sort of coastal constituency, and, and uh, this winter has been very problematic mm-hmm. uh, dealing with a number of issues in East Antrim, to be honest. Uh, it seems a year on year increase issues with weather and climate and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Some uh, people built apartments have actually put sort of flood uh, prevention schemes in place, mm-hmm. and but others and older haven't been able to do that. Just what, what role do you play in that and what does the forum really do? Um, the, well, the Coastal Forum has really been looking at a number of issues, so you know, trying to figure out where the areas that are most vulnerable are. Um, and then looking at, at what we can do to, to try to mitigate the risk. Um, I think the, the problem of not having one department with a virus to do something about it is that, and I'm not a marine scientist, and this is all very technical, but you know, if, for example, you decided this is an area of coast that is um, prone to erosion, we're going to shore it up and protect it, what you could end up doing is causing um, accelerated erosion further up or down the coast, depending on the direction of, of wave action. So it's something that you can't just rush into and shore up. Um, so, I mean, what, what we have been doing, as I said, is this baseline. Um, DERA actually um, managed to get some EU funding, so they're doing a piece of work to take that debate a bit further on and start looking at it more detail about what might be done in, in some of the areas to at least get the information. Um, we've also developed some guidance for um, uh, planners and local councils. Um, I mean, they're in a difficult position because, you know, in, in um, looking at planning applications along shorelines, without hard and fast evidence and data as to whether that is prone to coastal erosion or not, it's difficult to know whether that's um, a valid planning application. So, you know, we've got some guidance about areas they can look um, and, um, and how they should approach it. Um, in the absence of that hard data. Um, but it is quite difficult. Um, the, the forum was set up at ministerial level. We haven't had ministers for a number of years, but clearly we're also um, talking to our minister now about how she wants to take take that work forward. I think it's important to go forward because obviously um, it's a year on year, it just seems to be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and the National Trust is also very um, proactive. And, and in fact, the, the last meeting was, was held down at Mount Stewart um, and they took us out and showed us some of the work they'd done there um, in managing their coastline. But they manage about, I think it's around 30% of the coastline of Northern Ireland. They own it or manage it. So they're a big player. How often has the forum met in the absence of the Assembly? Um, we had a kind of a stock take, and then we ha- we've had two more formal meetings, which the Permanent Secretaries and the Departments chaired. Um, so, you know, we've tried as, as much as we could 
um, in the absence of proper powers to, to move the debate forward. Um, there's obviously two different views as to how this should be managed, either by hard engineering mm -hmm. or by sort of basically letting it go and sort of yes. returning it to nature. Has there been that conflict in the in the forum at this stage, or is it still just a matter of trying to get the data? Because obviously we're in the same situation as we were a number of years ago, and yeah, it doesn't yeah. seem to be a, a huge amount of progress. Yeah. Well, you know, I think we were hoping that the, the baseline study would be a bit more definitive, but really what it showed was that whilst there was there were pockets of information here, there, and everywhere. There wasn't enough information at the same level, measuring the same things, to make a coherent, to take any coherent approach. So really, now we're, we're at the stage of scope. Well, how do we approach that? And you know, technology is moving on. You know, we're looking at with lidar, you know, one lidar suite. There's a satellite option we've heard about recently. You know, so we need to explore the best way of getting the information we need to then make an informed decision about how best to move forward. And I, I know that sounds like we're pushing it down the line, but we're doing what we can with the limited resources we've got. So the Scotland are much further advanced in all of this in, in the, the they are, and, and you know, Scotland, England and, and Wales have and, and indeed Ireland have very specific um, requirements in law and uh, so if there's know, any lessons that could be learned from Yeah. And um, we are we do liaise quite frequently with, with all our colleagues um, in, in the British Isles, and, and we're actually involved in some um, joint research programmes, particularly around um, you know, sea level rises and, and, and wave action and that sort of thing, um, where you know, there, there's actually a British Isles-wide survey study being done, and we're involved in that as well. So I mean, there, there is informative work being taken forward to, to try and, and figure out where we are. And you know, in terms of the coast and sea level, I mean, it's interesting, actually, as, as an island, um, Ireland is kind of tipping. So, you know, in a Stick on east or west. Well, in a, ge in a geological um, North perspective, south, eh? from a geological perspective, we're actually rising, and so Cork is going Thank down. You. It's on that kind of <laughs> axis. But unfortunately, we're not rising as fast as, as predicted sea level rises. So, you know, we still have to take that into account. Oh. Um, and, you know, we're looking, when we look at the, the flood risk management plans, we're, we're looking at um, either projected climate change. We, we recently changed the epoch from 2035 to 2080 because, you know, in climate change terms, 2035 is around the corner. Um, so, you know, we're, we're factoring all of that into um, the, the new, right. new set of plans. But just in some areas, uh, pockets where it actually would affect uh, public transport. Yes, and, and, and yeah, and again, you know, we are regularly in contact with with Translink um, and, and and also roads. You know, you'll know particularly around the, the Orange Peninsula that they're continually having to shore up their sea defences to protect the the um, transport links. So it is an issue. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just in relation to the Northern Ireland water, one of the discussions has been for a while about mutualisation. Yes. So what consideration has been given to that, and what do you see the yeah. pros and cons of that? You want to take that? Yeah, sorry. Um, so mutualisation is yeah, it's, it's one of the business models, if you like, that's out yeah. there. Um, we often look to Wales, Welsh water as, a, as, a, as an example of that, not, not strictly a mutual, but, um, uh, but, but that type of yeah. language is used in, in that sense. Um, now, Welsh water obviously has the benefits of, um, uh, well, well, has the policy rather of water charging, so customers get tr tr charged. There's no government subsidy provided to Welsh water for that. Um, they've uh, got uh, access to uh, debt borrowing from bond markets. Um, so they've got, a, I guess, a a predictable um, revenue stream, guaranteed revenue stream, which allows them to make a lot more different flexibilities, a lot more different choices, maybe than what um, our water and sewage sector provider in, 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 in Northern Ireland has got. Um, so uh, it's it's an option, but clearly there's a consequence in terms of domestic uh, charging policy if that business model is, is, is something to be pursued. Um, it's something actually. I think the, the assembly paper from um, there was an assembly paper produced in October 2014 that we uh, dug out of the archives and uh, it looked at uh, different uh, water and sewage sector providers uh, across uh, the UK and the Republic of Ireland, okay. and uh, Welsh Water was one of those. Um, and uh, within that paper, it concluded itself that yeah. Uh, to use like, a mutual style business model um, didn't require a change in, in, in 
domestic water charging policy. Um, so it's, it's one of those, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting case study. Yeah. Yeah. What, what would the negatives be associated with mutualisation? Um, well, clearly with mutualisation comes a, a complete change in, in uh, government control. Mm. Um, so a mutual company would be uh, owned by members. Um, the governance of it is completely different. Um, so um, I guess the, the GOCO uh, NDPB model that we have here in Northern Ireland, um, that would um, clearly have to be scrutinised and yeah. choices made on that. Yeah. Yeah, well, there would have to be a change to legislation, which isn't a disadvantage, and, no. and if it was political will, that's what would be done. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's not in line with current government policy. Yeah. The issue for me is that the level of investment is going to be required in our water and sewage infrastructure. I just don't see that happening in the mm -hmm. short to medium term. Mm -hmm. And we can skirt around this and we'll be back here year after year after year after year in this. And what we've got in my own position here is that we've got to show some leadership in this because the implications of not doing the investment are very, very clear, whether that's in relation to plan applications not being approved, but also the risk of pollution. Yeah. and uh, fines associated with that, and whether well, there has been any scoping in terms of the potential sort of fines and pollution around if we don't invest in our... Well, um, you know, we do know that um, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency is actually looking at um, making the way in which it measures um, wastewater treatment uh, more robust, right. um, and also potentially um, you know, responding to new environmental um, threats such as new microplastics yes. and, and, and all of that. So, you know, if anything, um, their scrutiny is going to become a lot more rigorous, yeah. um, which in, in and of itself is going to lead to the need for more investment. Um, and then if you add on, um, you know, the impact of, of more economic development, you'll just get more and more pressure on the wastewater system. Yeah. So you're quite right. I mean, it, it is a big concern. Um, now, the new regime isn't likely to, to kick fully in for another six years, but you know, that's something that's coming down the track us. Yeah. And over the next six years in, in the PC21 um, period, Northern Water is going to have to prepare itself for that. And you know, we are, we are working collectively because we know it's, it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm by no means saying that the Environment Agency is doing the wrong thing, no. um, but it will take more money that it currently we don't have. So it's an issue that will only compound. Thank you. Just one quick question in relation to the reservoirs. Is a transfer of functions order to be made? Is there any idea in the timescales? Yeah, well, I think because it's sitting on DERA, it's right. up to the DERA minister to instigate that process. But you know, we are working with DERA to, to make sure that that happens. We're, we're quite keen that. to get cracking on it. Some members have outlined some of the concerns. And, yes. You know, it's really good to, to get this legislation moved. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Kelly. Thanks. Uh, can I just ask, I noticed recently there was, hi Simon, good to see you, <laughs> um, uh, that uh, there were fines for, from a, a, a fairly well-known agri-food business, you know, about discharge uh, into the waterways. And I just wondered about your views on the fines that are imposed through the courts, whether they're really reflective of the costs of any cleanup. And, and do they yeah. discourage? Are they incentivised yeah. enough? I can't really comment on court Fines. Um, what I can say is that um, you know that Water has been charging the company involved um, to uh, actually truck their waste out of the site um, to take it to wastewater treatment works to get treated, to actually get round the fact that it was causing environmental damage and pollution in the area and, and the bad odour as well um, for the people living in and around it. Um, so, you know, and that will continue until a long-term solution is found for that particular site. Uh, Chair, just wonder in terms of general, generally around pollutants, around industry and mm -hmm. uh, other, uh, uh, in terms of your overall policy in relation to dealing with that, um, uh, are we um, serious enough in relation to having a more greener, uh, mm -hmm. friendly, eco-friendly environment around some of our regulations and legislation, or does that need a serious...? Yeah, well, the, the regulations relating to wastewater treatment are actually sitting in DERA. Mm -hmm. um, so they, the Environment Agency deals with, with all of that, so that's their regulatory um, role. Um, I suppose what, what Northern Ireland Water is, is looking at, um, and again, it, it won't be the solution in every site, but for, for some smaller developments and, and, and uh, villages, they're actually looking at more natural ways of treating wastewater. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, you know, in, in, in Stonyford, um, and uh, there's, there's a site down in Fermanagh as well, um, they're actually looking at um, natural pools where it comes in at the top and it goes through a series of pools. And um, it might sound odd, but you know, enzymes and plantings treat the water as it goes through over a number of days and actually the water at the end comes out um, and it's it's clean. Mm -hmm. So that's a very non-invasive way of actually dealing with foul water. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Northern Water will also look um, at various industries and, and, and give various grades of, of uh, dis dis discharge consent, which that company then needs to abide by, otherwise they're in breach. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's quite a complex thing, there's all sorts of things going on, but the ultimate um, uh, uh, monitor of that is actually NIEA. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, at one time NIW were accused of being one of the worst polluters. <laughs> Have, has the company itself cleaned up with that? It, it actually has, yes. Um, it had no pollution incidents last year um, from an NIA perspective. You know, that, that they, um, they didn't have any breaches. And, and in fact, um, for a company that has been underfunded on both the water, clean water and wastewater side of their business, um, they uh, achieved the highest standards ever. So, and, and you know, I, I was at a meeting recently in NIA and they showed me a graph of you know, the, the, um, the breaches um, of any kind of regulations um, from Northern Water's perspective, and they have gone down quite dramatically. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you. I'll be brief because speech is not all our members. <laughs> Regarding combined a foul and, and a storm, how big a problem do you see that across your, your old network, as I would call it? So, for mm. example, today, is your flow meters giving you a different reading than on a dry day into your wastewater treatment plants? And I'm looking at you, Simon, and I don't know Well, I mean, from the, the Living with Water programme, uh, which, which I'm heading up, uh, one of the key discussions that I've had with, with NI Water since I've taken up this post is that the, the hard engineering work that they're doing will not just be sufficient to deal with the overall problem. Because as the stormwater as the stormwater gets into the combined sewers and overflows into the rivers and the network and gets into the sea, you know, all of the all of the um, water is not getting to the treatment works, so some of it is not being treated. So there's no, this is not the blue green aspect of this is not just nice to do; it is essential to do, um, and it will be contributing significantly to the overall quality water quality in Belfast Lock in and around the. You know, the Belfast plan. And the lessons that we learn from that within the Belfast plan, we intend to roll that out through guidance across the rest of Northern Ireland. So that, that can those those opportunities that we identify in Belfast could then be replicated across other council areas. And really with the Living with Water program, um, you know, it really is about identifying opportunities and where, where other organisations are investing, for instance DERA that we've had conversations with May, from a climate change point of view, may want to do tree planting. Um, now, tree planting obviously is good for climate change. It's also good for uh, naturally treating water flows. And if we do that in an upper, ca in an upper catchment management basis, that helps us. A lot of the problems, where the problem is, the solution isn't always where the problem is. The solution can be some distance away. And that's why. The Living with Water programme is slightly different and from the SUDS perspective that Linda was talking about, where new development, new developments will deal with what they're doing with. Mm. The Living with Water programme is trying to retrofit the whole catchment. Um, and that's slightly you know, that, that's that's where the Living with Water programme is. In, in relation to your question about the number of discharge, I can't give you that information because you don't have it. But it'd be interesting to know, you know, on a dry day you'll have a certain cubic metres per yeah. hour or, or the twenty four hour period in a down after that treatment plant. But that will increase because I've seen flooding around local yeah. towns yep. in Mid Ulster where wet day sewage goes up. That tells me storm is going to sewage. So how big a problem is that to then overload your wastewater treatment plants? Because on a dry day you may be okay, but yeah. on a wet day you're then it, you're maxed out. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a yeah. correlation between a rainy day and a dry day. If you're yeah, doing. I mean it's interesting actually. Sometimes the problem isn't so much at the treatment plants; it's it's in the network itself. Yeah, yes, but that's the point. If you can, that's if where you the can flooding really occurs. Network, um, but because you know, 
Some plants um, just have a volume. Some plants have a problem because of the volume of biological load, yeah. is the polite way of putting it. Um, <laughs> uh, so that doesn't change, um, that doesn't change uh, on, on a rainy day. Um, but it is more likely to then overwhelm the whole system. And then you get out of surf flooding, which goes into people's houses. But and that must be the worst thing ever. It'd be interesting to get those figures. Yeah, I'm sure you can no, know Northern what. Water will be able to provide all of those. And, and we can either get them for you, or I know you're actually going down to the Belfast. Yeah. wastewater treatment works on the 11th and that might be a really good opportunity because you'll see it and if it's a rainy day you'll really well, see I think it. that is a problem <laughs> I think the storm is, is too is, is connected to the fire yeah and, too many, too many and that, that, that is absolutely the case and that's why for new developments you know we're trying to encourage and it is now the norm that you separate the storm and the foul sometimes though the problem is you get new developments say on the outskirts of a town that are start off separated, but because the town is based on a Victorian sewage system, yeah. the two end up coming back in and getting reunited. Yeah. Now, what we are trying to do, and what Northern Water is, is, is very keen to do, is to keep those separated out and, and keep the sewers for what should be down the sewers. And as I've said already, you know, find a more natural and environmentally friendly and, and sustainable way of getting rainwater back out to the sea, which is where it end up. But, but that takes a huge amount of, of yeah, investment does. and cost, and you know, to, to retrofit the whole of the system now would but, be billions. But yeah, so effectively, you have an upgrade your wastewater treatment plants, or you split your network. Which is the cheaper? Well, actually, it, it, it's as I said, it's more to do with the pipes. Yes, but that's what I mean. So if you were to do yeah. that, if you were physically fit to do yeah. that, yeah. I think again, going back to the Living with Water program. I think there's a realisation that we can't retrofit all of the combined sewer system, so we have to operate as best we can. Yeah. Where new um, connections come on board and we can take those straight to the, the water course, that's great. But with the Living Water Programme, what we're trying to do is slow the stormwater getting into the combined sewer yeah. to reduce the number of combined sewer overflows. So you're, you're, you're exactly right, but the Living with Water Programme is trying to look at the whole catchment, slow the water down. It, we know it's going to get to the combined sewer, but if we slow it down, um, it's like a traffic light system. If you slow the traffic down, you know, if you all come to the same point at the same time with congestion, it's, you know, with the uh, with the combined sewer, if we can flow the or slow the surface water getting into the sewers, then that gives us more capacity. You talk about reed beds, as I know them, the reed bed system for mm -hmm. for discharge. Is that something you're actively progressing? Is that something you would encourage? Um, certainly, say rural villages or yeah, small towns. I mean, it will only work for small populations. Um, but Northern Water is looking to expand and extend um, what they're doing. So I, th I think they're, they're now considering Limavati as a, a potential next site. I mean, they're still piloting it all, um, but it, it's certainly um, a more environmentally friendly way of, of looking at things. And one final question: We in Northern Ireland, according to this, is using 150 litres per day on an average person. I don't know what an average person is, but I know. <laughs> what do we like? What do we like to the rest of the United Kingdom or Europe based on those figures? You know, yeah. just give us an indication: Are we are we too, no, too, we're not, too much water? We're, it's maybe slightly higher, but not a million miles away. Okay. Um, but it, again, that is something that we'd like to encourage. And you know. A, Customer behaviour is not going to solve the problem, but it will help. Um, so, you know, looking at water efficiency in the home, not putting stuff down the toilet that you shouldn't, um, which causes blockages, um, which then also create out of sewer flooding and flood people's homes. Um, you know, encouraging businesses not to put oils, fats, and greases down. And I'm sure you've seen some of the programmes on Fatworks. And some of the stuff that Northern Ireland Water finds down at down at drains is just disgusting. Some of it is bizarre. I mean, they've, they've, they've hoiked bikes and Barbie dolls and cats and live um, and you know, placards and all kinds of things from their sewers. It's amazing what ends up down there. So, so what, what would that need to turn into to leave the, a no, no problem with our, our treatment plants? What would that 150 litres need to be to make? Um, it, it's not so much what we um, what we use. It's, it's what we discharge. and. And there, you know, it, it's, I, I don't have the figures as to how much, how much we just don't have to produce in terms of wastewater. Yeah. Um, if we're using 150, it's all going to start or to fail. Only drinking a small percentage of the 150 litres we're using, well, four litres. Th yeah, th th there's less that, th so it's something like 750 million litres goes in and 385 or something comes out. Um, so we do absorb and I, I don't know. Yeah. I, 
comes out sweat. I don't know, but um, you know, there is less. But but I don't think um, I don't think asking people to produce less foil is going to work. Waste is the solution, really, particularly when we're looking at growing our economy and you know encouraging more tourists and you know all that that brings. Um, we we really need to um, build um, uh, well a build better <coughs> treatment. Uh, systems, but B, also look at more environmentally friendly ways of dealing with the clean stuff, the, the rainwater, and, and that is the big challenge that both Simon and I are, and Northern Ireland Water and, and, and its stakeholders are, are all facing. Okay. Okay, thank you, Ms Anderson. Thank you, and uh, Linda, it's good to see you again. Um, bear with me with your indulgence as saying this is my, my first meeting here of, of the committee. Uh -huh. um, but I just want to, to avoid doubt. And give certainty. I know that um, people are aware of each of the political parties' uh, position, but Sinn Féin will not support water charges now, nor ever. But I would like to hear more, uh, and maybe, you're, maybe today, in terms of time, may not permit. But perhaps you could get back to us, because I found it interesting what you said about the budget cover mm -hmm. um, to spend capital. Mm -hmm. Um, that you know that that is a problem. Mm -hmm. So we, we we really shouldn't, in my opinion, been thinking about how we charge uh, the public for this mm -hmm. when there was a potential opportunity to address that by giving the cover. Mm -hmm. If we understood, and we would like as a scrutiny committee, I'm sure others to to know more about that because we want clean drinking water. And for your colleagues earlier, I was talking about uh, my boy dump, mm -hmm. and we're very concerned in Derry in terms of the drinking water there, and that's the potential contamination of all that's happening. So we know uh, we know the importance mm -hmm. of having clean drinking water and everything else that goes along with it. I'm, con I'm concerned and interested to, to learn about the, the issue around the reservoirs and 179 controlled reservoirs. Uh, perhaps it's my limited knowledge, and I'll, like not, I, I'll state that. But it seems to me a bit of a dog's dinner has been made from 2016 with a transfer of functions order. I would like to know more who, has, who was responsible for transferring functions, the statutory responsibility from DARD to DERA as opposed to DARD to your department, mm -hmm. but the staff moved to your department. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask questions because that's where the staff is uh, currently, even though there is, and I would, I would agree with my colleague, it would be uh, interested to know when the transfer um, order is going to be initiated. If we had any information, maybe that's something we could ask uh, the Minister about. But it's a policy guidelines that I would like to ask about, about PPS 15. And I say that in the context, and I'm sure other members have other reservoir issues that they may want to bring to your attention, but it's the aspect of that um, FLD5 mm -hmm. that, uh, that totally ignores and admits the, what I understand to be the globally accepted practice in formulating a three-tier risk assessment, assessment mm -hmm. and it, it only permits a, a worst-case scenario. And I say that in the context here of what happened in my own constituency of Derry when there were opportunities for, for instance, the building of 79 houses, and there were some of those houses uh, that were allocated to, uh, to those more vulnerable in society, and they had actually been told they were getting those houses. And then along with that, we had a community facility going to, going to be built uh, as well in the Greater Glen area. But because of this particular policy that only has come into being in, in, in recent years, that actually prevented, given the fact that the reservoir has been designated as in a worst case scenario, and account wasn't taken of the fact that uh, work had been done with that reservoir to both strengthen it in the 1990s, um, as well as that a safety run had been put in place, and then a hydro um, electric system that at a point of a button could, uh, could ease any, any particular pressure. And I know that's one in the, in the other reservoir, for instance, a previous minister had, um, had given commitments to, uh, to a not-for-profit organisation that was in exist or has, is in existence, Craig and Country Park, that the uh, remedial um, work that needs to be put in place, that they would get a grant aid uh, for that. 
and that was had been written and communicated to them at that time. And so the remediation work that needs to be taken forward, obviously they would need some support as a not-for-profit um, charity to be able to do that. And I ask this known, and the reason my chair, the staff is located in this department, mm -hmm. although the statutory functions is in another department, and, and that's where I asked who in an undergrad, and like, I know at the beginning of this process it was very complicated uh, for people when they were developing the new departments and making sure that the transfer of, um, of orders came into being and in a way that was going to make sure that this didn't happen. But, and I know well, the executive been down, but hopefully it's up and hopefully we'll get a time frame for the minister. Because we have got concerns because potential development is being stopped as a consequence of the policy. And I would like to know when this comes over. Does that mean then that the particular policy and guidance also comes over into this department that allows us then to do our role in monitoring and interrogating that? You mentioned, um, you mentioned some of the Water Framework Directive and the Flood Directive and the Drinking Water Directive. And I'm asking another question with regards to what assessment has been done with regards to the risk of Brexit. Uh, to ensure that here in terms of the north we're going to be protected against any potential regressive measures that may come into being because a level playing field has been taken out of the withdrawal agreement which potentially opens up opportunities if some would see it in that way to, um, to lessen the kind of protections that we currently have as opposed to building upon them. Okay, so I think there's probably four things to that. So, um, first of all, in, when I said about giving budget cover, I mean that is the equivalent of the department having the money to give that budget cover. So, uh, what I'm not saying is that, you know, we just decided not to give them the cover. Um, but, you know, if we and if we had, they could have, you know, and water could have had access to the money. We can't give them budget cover because we don't have the money in our budget. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it, it, it's back to the problem, all the problems that you, you discussed with John McGrath. It, it's a lack of, of budget within the department that is the problem. Um, so it's, you know, it's not Northern Ireland Water's fault, it's not, it's not the department's fault because we've given them as much money as we can afford in the round. Um, and you know, the Minister is facing very difficult decisions, clearly, given all the pressures on her budget. Um, so it, it's departmental budget cover that is the problem. Okay. Does that answer yeah, that yeah, question? Yeah. Um, in terms of, of my boy, um, I mean, I can only speak for the, the water side um, of, of this. Um, and, and you said already before that there are, are legal cases ongoing. But what I can assure you about is that Northern Water has worked very closely with both the Environment Agency and the Drinking Water Inspectorate. It's put in a very rigorous um, regime of testing um, at the abstraction point at Clogo on the Fochen. Um, far, far higher um, regime than would norm be normally the case, and so far there have been no issues. Even during the very, very big flooding in the mm -hmm. northwest, yeah, where yeah. I think it was a problem that you know that might dislodge or, or um, you know, affect the site, but uh, so far so good. That said, you know they're not resting on their laurels, and actually um, they they reprioritised. Um, a piece of resilience work that they wanted to do on their drinking water supply. So uh, Northern Water was going to run um, a two-way pipe between um, uh, Derry and Straban. Now they're going the other way between there and Ballon Reese, which is further around the coast. So that should there in the future be any issues with um, the water being abstracted from the Fochen, they would have the resilience to draw drinking water from another uh, source until the problem could be solved. They also have clear water tanks at the site um, uh, at Carmony, um, which is a, a few days' supply. So, you know, that's also giving them a buffer. Should anything go wrong, but as I said, at the moment there's no sign that, that the fucking is being impacted. Um, Can I just ask on that, just chair, with your indulgence, because of the. You know the extent of the potential contamination that mm -hmm. is in there with the um, with the waste mm -hmm. that has been uh, dumped yeah. and left there yeah. for for far too long, yeah. and obviously you have the enforcement order. Uh, you can understand mm. the concern is growing because mm. you can't have that volume of waste mm. uh, just left yeah. uh, yeah. and so near a river. And I, I, I have yeah. to say, I've heard different assessments yeah. uh, from other people with regards to um, yeah. whether the water 
and the river yeah. has not been you know, contaminated or is not yeah. near to be contaminated than, yeah. what, than what's well, been suggested I mean, here today. DARA is in the lead on that, um, the overall plan for um, dealing with the site and they're well aware that one of the first priorities will have to be um, protecting the site from any potential leaching um, into the river. Um, and they're working very closely with us and with Northern Water on that. Okay. Okay. Just in relation to that, but we can write to the committee, DARA committee, with regards to Mogoy and get an update okay. then okay. directly from the department. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, then uh, you talked about reservoirs and the draft order. Um, I mean, the, the, the draft order um, was drafted, I think, when it, when it left DARD, the Reservoirs Act was certainly on it. But when it got passed through the assembly, it wasn't. And I don't know where, where it fell off. Um, we, can we try to explore that? Because it would be interesting to know like how you can had, end up with a statutory... We have had discussions, obviously the Minister was here and, and briefed us in relation to that too. So, um, yeah, I think the main thing to focus on now is getting it back where it If it goes on too or something like that doesn't yeah. happen. If it, and, if, and, you know, it, how did that happen? Yeah, and I, even with DARA, I mean, there was so little of it actually commenced. So, you know, we, we commenced what you defined as a controlled reservoir and some of the sort of very high level things, but none of the actual teeth of the legislation itself. So even if DARA wanted to, it couldn't have done anything because it would take um, draft affirmative legislation to get the, the proper um, management regime for reservoirs in place. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, as I said, my minister's keen to, to, to get that moved across um, so that we can start that. Um, I absolutely understand um, that planners have been put into a difficult position in the interim because you're quite right, FLD5 was drafted on the basis that this legislation would be in place and fully enacted and that access to the required information would be a lot easier than it is now. Um, so we've been working um, you know, with my, my colleagues um, here, maybe going to see today, um, depending on time, um, uh, on planning and with um, the group of planners from local government and we've developed and, and rivers, um, DFI rivers, and I mean they are the ones that, that are, um, they give planning advice on flooding. So. You'll be able to ask Jonathan McKee, my, my colleague who's with you next week, in, in a lot more detail about, about that. But we have collectively worked to develop um, guidance um, to make it a bit clearer about what uh, approach planners should be taking in the absence of this legislation. So that you know we, we don't um, stop development that really could or should be happening, but equally that we don't do something that could actually in, in endanger lives. And, and oh, absolutely, but uh, it's, it's the worst case scenario yeah. at all and times. But you, you know, can see there has been actually some yeah. resolution to two other reservoirs yeah. uh, that had come up with the same, where the three risk yeah. uh, assessments weren't applied. So we would like the same thing, for instance, yeah. to, to be taken forward with yeah. regards to the particular reservoir in the yeah. Glen. And, and, and if there's a particular case, I'm sure Jonathan will be able to talk okay. about that next yeah. week. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Beggs. Oh, sorry. Oh. Um, one, one last thing. Um, uh, your fourth question, um, which was um, uh, not making sure that we were arrested um, post post exit on, on all of those things. Now, I'm responsible for the floods directive. Um, as I said, you know, the the full requirements of the flood directive were transposed into our laws mm -hmm. uh, some time ago. We've made the amendments to ensure that those will continue. Um, and there are no plans to look at um, reducing that. Um, you know, we've also made sure because water actually flows and it, it, it's blind to borders. So, um, you know, we will continue to um, cooperate because two of our three water uh, river basins actually cross the border. So it's important that we actually continue to cooperate with um, the Office of Public Works, um, which is our equivalent. Is there a non-regression clause in that? So that any other further development of, um, for instance, any other directive that was going to be applicable across mm -hmm. across the island so that you didn't have a non-regression and um, that you had one applying, for instance, one directive, yeah. a new directive that may emerge post-2020 to the yeah. south, another one in the north, and then you have... No, there's, there's not, because all we could do, again, in the absence of the ability <coughs> to have ministers and, make, and, and politicians to make new policy, all we could do was ensure that the current policy continues. Yeah. Um, so the, the amendments that we made, and we had to make those through DEFRA um, to get them through on time, um, uh, were to ensure that they continue to operate as they are at as the moment. Are. Yeah. 
Um, so there's no additions there's or changes. No future proof in it. Okay. No. Thank you, Mr. Finally, brief. Uh, at the very beginning, you indicated that Northern Ireland Water was a go-go setup. Mm -hmm. um, but Brighton said it's really in the worst of all designs to run any organisation is to create a long-term go-go. Well, it was set up under the legislation as a go-go, but at that point in time, the, the plan was to introduce full, full water charging. So it, it was really set up. Um, the nearest equivalent would be Scot Scottish Water, which is a go-go with full water charging. But that full water charging has never come in. So a couple of years after it was created, that's when the Office of National, National Statistics turned around and said, well, actually, do you know what? It's also an NDPB. So you're quite right. I mean, it, it is a very difficult set of but Does this make decision-making very slow and prolonged and bureaucratic and costly? Um, it certainly adds layers. We try to work as swiftly as we can within the rules that we've got. But there are layers of approvals that Northern Ireland Water has that other utilities wouldn't have, and layers of, of you know, financial approvals, and you know, that they're hooked into the um, public procurement regulations, they're hooked into public pay policy, and, and all of that. Yeah. Has there been an attempt to uh, find out how much savings could be uh, established through a more efficient arrangement, whether that is entirely inside the department mm -hmm. or a, a se separate mutual No, because it's not government policy to do it any different way. So okay. uh, certainly civil servants, we wouldn't have a mandate to go and see how much we could save if we did it differently. Earlier on, we had the um, Deputy Secretary with us mm -hmm. and uh, talking largely about transport and, mm -hmm. and roads issues. And I, I picked up a comment from me. It says, we have to fund our flagship projects and then see what's left. Is this what's happened with um, Northern Water, that flagship projects are all um, developing, sucking mm -hmm. limited capital we have, and everybody else is left suffering and infrastructure uh, underinvest in, uh, and as a result, huge areas of the country cannot be developed and new plans yeah. cannot proceed? Is this what's happening? Well, you know, I suppose I, I, I can't speak on behalf of the whole department for all of its finances, but um, I do know that, that in finance terms, flagship projects are seen as executive commitments and therefore are inescapable. Okay. Are politicians creating an impossible situation for public civil servants and public bodies to deliver? They don't want A, B and C and they're not prepared to uh, actually fund what they do want. Would that be correct? That civil servants are I in a, an impossible situation. <laughs> couldn't possibly comment. All, all I can do. I like the all I can do is is follow government policy as a civil servant, <laughs> which is a mess, and, and and support my minister to do what she wants to do. So, okay, thank you, Mr. Hilditch. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Uh, just to be supplementary on there. Uh, we previously heard from a presentation there in relation to the loss of uh, sort of experience and skilled worker. Mm -hmm. It would be my understanding that Northern Ireland Water and I depend a lot on subcontractors mm -hmm. to do just the day-to-day -day delivery of the service. Would there be a concern at the loss of experienced operatives uh, further down the line, having mm -hmm. we left the system now, taking early packages and such? Yeah, I mean, Northern Ireland Water has reduced its, its staffing levels. I think it's now sitting at around 1,700. 1300. Sorry, 1,300. Thank you. Um, but. You know, I, I suppose in doing that is actually also driven through an awful lot of efficiencies um, and it, it's reduced its operating costs in real terms by about 68 million odd. Um, now I'm not saying that's all down to losing staff. What I am saying though is that it is operating in a way now where with underfunding it, it's actually achieving better than ever levels of you know, service to its customer water quality and wastewater quality. Now, we've talked about its problems about not actually being able to add new customers to its list, because if it did that, then all of those um, standards would, would start to slip, and, and, and that's, that's the problem. You know, it, it's got this capacity issue. Um, but I think it's operating in a very efficient way, and, and maybe that's something you'd wish to explore directly with the company. Thank you. No one else has indicated, so can I thank okay. you very much, Linda? Thank you. Simon. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Members, moving then to um, item 10, which is draft um, forward work programme. Just draw your attention to that on page 180. Obviously, because of the um, 
overrun today. We've had to move uh, our planning briefing to, to, to next week, so that will be included for the 26th. And we'll probably then move the research um, briefing um, to perhaps the day that we're doing our, our strategic plan. Um, on that day, we're, next week, we're also visiting the Traffic Control Centre and the Winter Service Depot. Um, at, we're going to do that around 12 o'clock. So I have a number of names, but I'd just like to see if anyone else would confirm, because we do need to give names in advance. There's myself, um, Roy, Andrew, Liz and Keith have confirmed. Um, Cahill. Yes. Anyone else? No, no, no. Real okay, we'll, okay, what we'll do is when we circulate something around those who haven't um, okay. communicated back um, in order to let them know in advance. So if you're content with the forward work programme then and with those amendments. Yep, yep. yep. Um, members of any other business? No? Okay, thank you. Moving then to our next meeting will be so next one Wednesday week morning. Quick, sorry. Oh, Mr Boylan again. No, no, no. When you looked at the issue is um, the story on this morning about the events again. Can we get some word back on it? Yes, that was in relation to the, I mean, the, 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 last the, the the issue of the, the community groups and all being charged to run yes. these wee charity events and the expense. There's loads of them now, and this has been going on for some areas are only experienced this now. Some of the other areas experienced this two years ago. When it's the way the council has run the policy out. Now, I would say if this committee was running this piece of legislation, this SL1, it would definitely be in favour of that they're putting the cost. Onto the, onto the actual we, have, we always had a briefing in relation yeah. to yeah. that the week before last. Um, and they were going review, to, they were going to, to review. undertake a review. Yes. What we can do is we can just um, send a note through to officials and obviously mindful of the fact that this is now quite a live issue oh, um, to yes. get some feedback from them yeah. on that. Yeah. I think it's, if it's okay, Chair, as well, I think it's important to make the point to us there's a review. That review needs to take into account the people who have been affected by this. Yeah. This camp has done a review in silos by officials who are you know, not really listening to their real concerns that this is affecting yes. people on the ground, so they need to listen to these uh, concerns. Yeah. Okay, we're happy to do that. Can I just ask for a bit of clarity, because uh, you know, for, forgive my sort of lack of knowledge of how things were navigated at the last, uh, the, the last assembly, but I find it a bit surprising, and maybe it's because I don't understand how um, um, in the transfer order, it moves from the department with a recommendation to go from one department to another, and this is in the line with scrutiny, and then it goes through the assembly. I'm just not sure what that means. It went through the assembly and it came out the other end without it being there. So I wouldn't mind some clarity as to how that could happen okay, um, in, in the assembly context, please. Sir, certainly the clerks are, in, are liaising with the clerk in the DIRA committee as well. In okay, to this. Yeah. We're very mindful of this and we want to move it on very quickly because we were all experiencing yeah, this issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the we should to get to understand it. Further information so our next meeting is next Wednesday at 10 o'clock in, in the Senate chamber. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.